Uh, good morning. Today is Tuesday, June 15th, 2021. Before we get into the game plan, uh, I know you guys had the Physio X uh, that was due today, and I got a couple emails about some of the problems with uh, saving them as PDF. So I wanted to go through that again uh, really quickly to uh, help to remind you. And if you're still having trouble with this, then I wanna encourage you to uh, come to office hours after class today so that uh, we can uh, go through this together to see, but let's come here. So again, through the study area, you go to the Physio X, go to any of the activities, we'll just pick activity four. And again, you're gonna go step-by-step step through all of the processes. At the end, you are going to have a lab report. Now, obviously we didn't do anything, so there's nothing in this lab report. But notice at the end of the lab report is this button uh, where it says printable, savable version. Now, if you have a long lab report, you have to scroll all the way down to the bottom to find that. When you click on it, it asks you to put in your name and you can. It'll have all the information in a more printable form here. And then when you click print slash save as, one of the options you should have is to save it as a PDF. Uh, so again, you can print it to the printer the way you would do it here, but you should have the option to save it as a PDF. If you don't have save as a PDF, there are a lot of free PDF um, uh, printers. Uh, 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 Cute PDF is an example. Uh, I think there's a ghost PDF or something like that. There are a couple different PDF uh, uh, printers you can get, which will save it as a PDF. And so if you just click as save as a PDF, have that as your option, uh, then it'll allow you to save it as a PDF. And you can just do that to your desktop and be able to um, save it that way. So that should be a way that you don't have to waste the paper, waste the ink, waste the time to print it out and take the pictures of it. So hopefully uh, for those of you who had some difficulties with that, hopefully that will help. And if you don't have these options, then let me know and we can go through it together, like I said, uh, in my office hours, uh, which reminds me of the other thing. If you want to come to office hours, uh, the office hours are, uh, oh good, thank you. Um, uh, again, for the five for five, when we're just meeting for a few minutes and because I want to meet with so many students, I think it's useful to set up those appointments in the confer Zoom. But my normal office hours are just in my uh, Zoom office, uh, which the link is on the main page and they're open uh, uh, office hours. So if you have questions right after class or if you want to go grab something to eat first and then come back uh, the hour first hour after class, I'm on the computer grading or doing other work and stuff like that. So you can just pop into the window. You don't have to make an appointment. If you want to make an appointment to make sure I'm there, you're welcome to do that. Uh, but it's an open it's an open office hour. So you can just like if we were on campus, I'd be sitting in my office and you could pop into my office uh, to ask questions. So you don't have to make an appointment if you have any questions or concerns that you wanted to meet after that. Uh, if the hour after class doesn't work for you, then email me and we can try to find some time outside of that to meet as well. All right, I think those are, I don't know what that is, that's gross. Um, I think that is all of the uh, TCOB stuff, the taking care of business stuff that we needed to worry about. Any other questions or anything before we get started today? All right, excellent. Then let's get started with our game plan. Uh, going stir first to our whiteboard again, uh, same as it was yesterday. So again, no new information here. Uh, today, we're going to continue our discussion of tissues and then start putting those tissues together to make membranes. Uh, we're going to spend our lab time doing histology and we're going to actually intermix lecture and lab today going back and forth between the materials to make sure we're uh, working our way through in a meaningful fashion. Still have a handful of assignments due this week all in preparation for Monday's exam. Again, the exams, lab and lecture, both must be taken, both must be taken during class time. You can take them in either order that you want, but from past experience, most people who have technical issues have them with the lab exam because they're very image-based. So I would encourage you to start with that one first, make sure that you don't have any problems uh, so that you give yourself time to work out any problems and still be able to complete the exams successfully. And then, as I mentioned, Tuesday, we move on to the skeletal system and uh, we'll be doing very informal group presentations for that, but we will need to form those groups, uh, those discussion groups and everything. So I'll need you here for Tuesday uh, on time for us to be able to do that as well. All righty, that is the game plan. So I'll ask one more time, any questions or anything before we get started? 
All right, perfect. So we left off last class and we were working our way through our simple epithelial tissues, right? And how many simple epithelial tissues are there? Eight. Well, how many simple ones are there? Uh, three. How many simple? Four. 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 Excellent. What were they? Uh, simple squamous. Epithelial tissue. Oops, why is this? There you go. Simple squamous epithelial tissue. What else? Simple cub cubital. cubital. And again, I don't care how you pronounce these things as long as you spell them correctly. I will be honest with you. Um, I am a horrible speller. Uh, not only am I a horrible typist, but I'm a horrible speller as well. It's not a good combination while I'm trying to lecture. But when I was a student learning all of these things, often I would mispronounce the things in my head to pronounce them the way that they looked, not the way they necessarily sounded. So one of my biggest challenges uh, when I actually started teaching was I had to relearn how to say all these things the right way because I'd been saying them wrong in my head the, the, the whole time. And again, your goal in this class is to get an A in this class. To do that, you have to be able to spell these things, not say these things. So I don't care how you say them as long as you spell them correctly. Excellent. Simple squamous, simple cuboidal. What else? Simple columnar. Pretty sure someone said there were four. So what's left? Pseudo. What the? Pseudostratified. Pseudostratified. Related columnar. And again, I don't care so much about the order. Uh, some people say ciliated, pseudostratified. Some people say pseudostratified, ciliated. Both are acceptable. Uh, really, the key to this one is you have to have all three parts, ciliated, pseudostratified, and columnar. So as long as all three parts are there, I don't care the order that you put them in. Just make sure they have all of those parts. Excellent. So those were the four simple epithelial tissues we had identified and we talked about them. And then of course, we know there are how many uh, stratified? Four. So there's four stratified epithelia. And what are the names of the ones that we know? The easy ones, the ones that we can piece together? Stratified squamous. Excellent. What else? Stratified cuboidal. What else? Stratified columnar. And of course, because we know anatomous hatus, there's going to be a curveball. Right? So obviously, if I have a tissue that is made up of two layers of block-shaped cells, what type of tissue would that be? Stratified cuboidal. cuboidal. Stratified cuboidal, excellent. Now answer another question for me. How many apical surfaces does this tissue have? One. One, one just one apical surface. How many basal surfaces does it have? One. Two. One. Right, we, everything always has one top and one bottom. It doesn't, it could be a million cell layers thick. It still only has one top and one bottom. And just to beat the dead horse, because it's going to be important, what would the extracellular material you would find in this location be? Basal membrane. Basal membrane, basal lamina, basement membrane, all of those are acceptable. Excellent. But let's take another example that's a little less obvious. Let's say, for instance, I have a tissue that is comprised of two tall, narrow rows of cells sitting on top of three rows of block-shaped cells. Yeah, let me make my blocks a little bigger. Sitting on top of a tissue that is just one layer 
of flat cells. What type of tissue would this be? Transitional. So excellent. We know now the name of our fourth type curve ball that uh, our uh, anatomists are going to name us. But as it turns out, this isn't a transitional epithelial tissue. Transitional is our fourth type, but that's not what this is. Anybody know what this actually is? Silence, I'm gonna guess means no, unless there's some shy people out there. That's okay to be shy. You can always type it in the window if you're shy, but um, three types is a guess as well. Some kind of combo platter or something along those lines. But no, it turns out there is actually a second rule to the naming of our stratified epithelial tissues. For a stratified, Epithelial tissue, of course, as we know, it has to be made up of two or more layers. But when it comes to identifying that tissue, it turns out a stratified epithelial tissue is named based on the apical layer. So you can have a tissue with all three different shapes of cells like this. But all we care about when it comes to figuring out its name is what is on top. So based on that, what type of tissue have I drawn here? Stratified, stratified squamous. squamous. This is indeed a stratified squamous, exactly. All right, excellent, 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 excellent. So we did these, let's look at these. Here are some nice illustrations of some of our stratified epithelial tissues. Notice here is our stratified squamous. And sure enough, with our stratified squamous, we have some columnar, we have some cuboidal shaped cells, right, all throughout. However, we don't care about that. In fact, for most tissues, what we care the most about is looking at the top. And at the top, we see that there are layers of flat cells. And so that makes this a stratified squamous, All right? Two or more layers, cubes on top. So this is a stratified cuboidal. Three layers of cells, two of them are block shape, but it's the one on top that matters. So this is a stratified columnar. All right, so again, with stratified tissues, we care about what's on top. This is important too, because let's look here at the stratified for a second. Let me clear my drawings. Notice if we look down here at what this looks like and we go back a slide and look at the actual picture of a ciliated pseudostratified, notice they look very similar at the basal layer. By the basal surface, they look very, very similar. And so if you just look at the basal surface, it can be very hard to tell these apart. So how do you tell them apart? You look at the top. Yes, it looks like multiple layers of nuclei on top of each other. But here on top, we have cilia. We have almost no nuclei at the top. That tells us it's that tricky bugger, the pseudostratified ciliated columnar. Whereas if we switch back here, right here, we have all these block shape appearing cells down at the bottom. But when we look at the top, we see flat cells. And so flat cells on the top, stratified squamous. All right, these are the tissue types. And let's go back to these two right here. Stratified columnar and stratified cuboidal are the least common tissues in the body. They're very rarely found, mostly just found in big glands. Because of that, and if you've looked at your handout, you will see that you are not responsible for them histologically. Now, if I asked you on an essay question to describe all the types of epithelial tissues, you would definitely want to name all eight types, including stratified cuboidal and stratified columnar. 
But on the lab exam, I will not be showing you a tissue slide of stratified cuboidal or stratified columnar which as the smart, sophisticated student that you are is important because on the lab exam, that means that stratified cuboidal and stratified columnar will never be a correct answer on the lab exam. So if you've written stratified cuboidal, be certain that you're getting it wrong because they won't be on the exam, all right? So the one, well, one of the ones you will need to know is stratified squamous. However, this one gets a teeny bit trickier. Anyone know where you would find a stratified squamous epithelial tissue? Well, it's got lots and lots of cell layers. What's the advantage of having lots of cell layers? Maybe your skin, so it replaces. Yeah. Right, absolutely. So it's a good, excellent. Stratified tissues, because it has lots of layers, is good for protection. protection, correct? And as someone mentioned, a great place to have that protection is here on your skin. This on your skin, you can go ahead and feel your cheek if you'd like, is a stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Now, we are in an anatomy and physiology class, and technically you are in your own home, and technically you have signed the lab waiver, but because technically we're in the class, I'm supposed to tell you not to do this, when you're on your own time, feel free to take your finger and stick it inside your mouth and feel the inside of your cheek. Because guess what? The outside of your cheek and the inside of your cheek are both covered by stratified squamous epithelial tissues. But does the outside of your cheek and the inside of your cheek feel the same? No. So what's the difference? The membrane. True, absolutely. One of the differences is the membrane, but what's the difference in the epithelial tissue? You're absolutely correct. These are two different membranes and we will get to the membranes, but we have to talk about connective tissues before we get to membranes. What's, okay, these are the easy questions. What's the difference between the outside of your cheek and the inside of your cheek? Wet and dry. Yeah, wet and dry, absolutely. The outside is dry. and the inside of your mouth is wet. Anyone know why there's that difference? What makes your skin out here dry? Um, I know you know, even if you don't think you know, you know. The reason the outside of your skin is dry is because the stratified squamous cells here inside of your skin produce a very special protein they fill the cells up with the protein so much so that the cell goes, you know what? I have so much of this special protein. I don't need a nucleus. I don't need an organelle anymore. And they basically chuck their nucleus, chuck their organelles and the cells die. As you know, the outer surface of your skin cells are just dead, hardened, flattened, fused together cells. And the reason for that is because they contain a special protein. And that special protein is called keratin. Keratin is what makes the skin uh, dry and hard. Inside of our mouth, we don't have that keratin, right? Remember, as I mentioned, the cells that fill up with keratin chuck their nucleus, they die. The inside of your mouth, these cells don't have keratin on the inside of your mouth, so they're actually still alive. So we have two different types of stratified squamous epithelial tissues, and we need a way to distinguish them. The one that makes up our skin that has the keratin, we call a keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue. And the skin on the inside, pardon me, the, 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 the tissue on the inside of your mouth is a non keratinized stratified squamous 
epithelial tissue. So we actually have two different types of squamous. And if you have trouble remembering which is which, right? We have the weekend right around the corner. Tomorrow is a day off. So it's a perfect opportunity for you to fly to London. And when you get to London, of course, one of the top things you wanna do is meet the queen. And when the queen holds her hand out to you, what are you supposed to do when you see that keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue? Kiss it. There you go. You kiss it. Keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue. That is the outer surface of the skin. Providing that protection and that waterproof and that hardness, that abrasion resistance and all of that. Notice the inside of your mouth doesn't have keratin, but it has many layers of cells providing lots of protection, right? For that sharp tortilla chip, that hot coffee, that really hot, hot pocket, that acidic wine and so on and so forth. So basically moist openings to the outside of the world, we wanna have protected by that non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue. So where else would you find that besides the mouth? No, what are some other openings to the outside world? Digestive system or the nasal cavity? Yeah, okay, so, well, remember, deep in the nasal cavity, we have that ciliated pseudostratified, but you're right, right at the opening, we have a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue, right? The beginning of our digestive system, our mouth, our pharynx, remember the proximal part of our esophagus we said isn't simple columnar, because those are all non-keratinized stratified squamous. Remember, we said the anus, uh, that's an opening to the outside world needs to be protected. That's a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue. The vaginal canal, the opening of the urethra, all of these are locations where we need protection, protection from the outside world, protection from friction, protection from all of these things. And so all of those are going to be lined with a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. However, as someone pointed out, we still have our curve ball tissue we have to deal with, and that is our transitional epithelial tissue. This becomes the part in the class where uh, young women and men, much like yourselves, and an instructor much like me have to learn about some of the important theories of life, right? What is it that makes the world go round? Come on, what makes the world go round? Like reproduction? Mm. Okay, so reproduction, definitely from a biological standpoint, that is vital, absolutely. But hopefully you're not necessarily reproducing every single day, right? So what, what makes the world go round every single day? This is usually when I get to find the pessimists and the optimists, right? Some people like to think that it's love. Some people think it's money. All right, nope, none of those are the correct answer. What makes the world go round is pressure, All right? And pressure doesn't necessarily mean your grandparents asking you when you're gonna get a job or when you're gonna have grandkids or any of those kind of things along those lines, All right? We're talking about pressure. Pressure is what makes the world go round, All right? And pressure is vitally important. If I have a balloon and I put a teeny bit of air into that balloon and I let it go, what's gonna happen? deflates. Yeah, it deflates. And it's basically going to deflate and it's going to fall to the ground. But what if I fill that balloon up and then let it go? What's going to happen then? Well, yeah. Air pressure is going to zip it around. Yeah, it's going to fly around the room. And the difference between those two is pressure. The more air I put into that balloon, the more stretch of that balloon. And that balloon is elastic and that elasticity has a recoil. And so the more I stretch it, the more pressure it produces. So the more it pushes on the air and the more it's gonna fly around the room. Well, you have hollow cavities like a balloon, kind of like that bladder sitting there on the screen right now. So there you are driving your car and you suddenly realize you have to urinate. 
or void urine, urinating is not the right term, voiding urine from your body. The problem is you just passed the street sign that said the next rest stop is 32 miles. So you have a choice, pull over to the side and find a bush or you drive for 30 more miles. You decide to drive for 30 more miles. And when you finally get to the next rest stop and you get out to urinate, do you go flying around the room like that balloon? Because of all the pressure that is built up from the urine in your bladder? No. No, of course not. And one of the main reasons for that is this transitional epithelial tissue. Unlike a balloon, which is elastic, so the more you stretch, the more recoil there is, the advantage of a transitional epithelial tissue is that it is able to expand. It can change its shape. Notice when this tissue is relaxed, the cells are very large and very uh, columnar or cuboidal in shape. However, this tissue has the ability to be stretched out. Notice here as it stretches out, the cells get uh, longer, they elongate, the number of layers get shorter. In fact, it's actually possible to stretch a transitional epithelial tissue out till it becomes a single layer of flat cells. Now, does, do you void urine with more pressure when your bladder is full than when it is half full? Yes, right? So pressure does still build up, but this transitional epithelial tissue dramatically reduces the pressure. And so not surprisingly, this tissue is found exclusively in the urinary system. In the ureters, which are the two tubes that carry the urine from the kidneys to the bladder, the bladder and the urethra carrying it out of the body. Now, we know where to find this transitional epithelial tissue. Now the trick is being able to recognize it. As I mentioned, one of the problems with all of our stratified tissues and with that ciliated pseudostratified is that when you look at them in the bottom layers, you just see a bunch of random nuclei and they all kind of look the same down here. So we want to look at the apical surface. And if we look at the apical surface of a transitional epithelial tissue, notice the cells on the top are these big block shaped cells big block shaped cells, right? With a stratified squamous, as you go apical, the cells get smaller and the cells get flatter. With the transitional epithelial tissue, the cells actually get bigger as you go towards the apical surface. Now, I appreciate that identifying all of these slides histologically, all these tissues histologically, especially the epithelial tissues, is kind of one of the more challenging things you have to do. So one of the things you should always do is kind of look for some dead giveaways that are really going to tell you, bing, right off the bat, what it is that you are looking at. And luckily, a, a transitional epithelial tissues have this. You won't see it on every single transitional epithelial tissue, but when you see it, it is a dead giveaway that you are looking at a transitional epithelial tissue. Notice something really interesting about this big block cell right on top on that apical surface of our tissue. What do you notice about that cell? The nucleuses are almost touching. Well, okay. You've got the key. Nucleuses, plural, nuclei. This cell has two nuclei. Do most of the cells that we've seen have two nuclei? No. Is it two different cells, though? Because in the other drawing, it looks like, or is it just one cell? Because in the other drawing, it looks like two. It, I, it, well, I don't think they tried to recreate it exactly for what they were doing here, but you've got it right on the nose. Some, epithel some superficial cells, some of the big block cells in a transitional epithelial tissue actually have two nuclei. Why is not fully understood. And like I said, you won't see it in all parts of all ep a transitional epithelial tissues, but if you do see it, 
it is a dead giveaway that you are looking at a transitional epithelial tissue. So if you see that apical cell with two nuclei, you know without, a, without a, you know, any thought or, or doubt that you are looking at a transitional epithelial tissue. All right. Questions on that. So there's our transitional, our fourth stratified. We've talked about where you find it. We talk about how you're going to identify it and everything with that. Questions on that. All right, perfect. Then let's put what we are learning to use. As I mentioned, this is definitely material that is going to potentially be on the exam. So let's go through some of this stuff together. Identify the specimen in the field of view. Kidney. Kidney, excellent. How did you know? Uh, well, the, the center, um, I was looking at slides yesterday of um, simple squamous epithelium cells on uh, kidneys, and uh, they look pretty similar. Uh, you can see the, uh, what's it called, the Bowman space. Um, Perfect. Excellent. You are absolutely correct. You are 100% correct. And you figured that out because you looked at it ahead of time. And that is spectacular. I appreciate that. I love that. That is absolutely spectacular and correct. However, if you hadn't, like Hiccup, already looked at it ahead of time, then maybe by looking at your handout, what's the very first question or the very first item you're responsible for on your epithelial tissue handout? Kidney. And what's in parentheses next to it? Specimen. Specimen. So it was the very first thing on your list. So I happen to ask you the very first thing on your list. But let's talk about how you would figure this out otherwise. And Jacob is absolutely correct on how you would do this. What you want to look for, as I mentioned, are dead giveaways. In this case, our dead giveaway is this structure right here. This structure in its entirety, what do you think this structure in its entirety is known as? What structure did uh, I get? Renal corpuscle? Yeah, the renal corpuscle, absolutely. Renal corpuscle. And guess how many places you find a renal corpuscle? Just in the kidney. Just in the kidney, it's in the name, renal. Renal refers to the kidney. So if you see this structure, the renal corpuscle, that is a dead giveaway that you are looking at the kidney. The kidney is the specimen because of this renal corpuscle. Now, let's talk about what this renal corpuscle is. The renal corpuscle is basically made up of three components. The first of them is a very special capillary. That special, blah, 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 try that again. And that special capillary is known as the glomerulus. Now, do you happen to need to know that? No. No, because it's not on your list. But we do need to know that this big curly Q fuzzy thing right in here is a big specialized capillary. That happens to be called the glomerulus, but you don't need to know that name. The second component is the parietal layer of Bowman's capsule. Why is it called Bowman's capsule? Why do you think it's called Bowman's capsule? And someone named 
There you go. Good old Bob Bowman was the first person who identified this, drew it up for a magazine and planted his flag in it. So got to name it after himself. So that is the structure. And basically this structure is a cup. Its job is to collect filtrate. Remember our kidneys job is to filter our blood. During the course of the day, you filter about 200 liters of filtrate out of your blood. Now, do you have 200 liters of extra stuff in your blood? No. Do you no. produce 200 liters of urine during the course of the day? No. If you produce no. 200 liters of urine, we'd all be giving this lecture or listening to this lecture in the bathroom, right? So 99% of that stuff is reabsorbed. We only produce about one to two liters of urine during the course of the day. So what happens is we need stuff to filter out of that blood vessel, and that's the glomerulus, and we need something to catch it in. And so this structure that catches it is called the parietal layer of Bowman's capsule. That is the structure. However, this structure needs to be tiny because each kidney has a million of these Bowman's capsules in them. So as you look at it, you can see that the tissue that this is made up is a single layer of flat cells. So Bowman's capsule is comprised of a simple squamous epithelial tissue, right? This is my desk. It is made of wood. This is Bowman's capsule. It is made of a simple squamous epithelial tissue. And there is a third component to our renal corpuscle, the space where we're going to collect that filtrate. Right? And what would that space where we're going to find that filtrate be called? Bowman space. Bowman space, absolutely. Now, Bowman space, Bowman's capsule are also sometimes referred to as the glomerular space and the glomerular capsule. They have anatomy and physiology is trying to get better about these antiquated terms. Bowman doesn't tell you anything other than the anatomist who planted his flag in it. But the glomerular capsule surrounds the glomerulus. The glomerulus space is the space around the glomerulus. So again, both of those are acceptable terms. You may, as always, use any appropriate anatomical term, uh, but I, I will try to give them all to you, or as many as I can. There are also others, uh, but, um, but that is that, all right? So notice on this slide, those are the things that you need to know, with one last exception, right? Uh, identify the organelle. I had a question about um, where the location of Bowman's capsule is. Was it yes. the, the black outline? Yes. Okay. Yeah, that black <laughs> outline is, a, so that, so again, and this is where, uh, again, uh, vocabulary becomes important. On the exam, I could have this picture, and let's make it even bigger so it's nice and obvious. I could have an arrow that points like this, and I could ask you two questions. Identify the layer. Actually, I could ask you three questions. Identify the layer. And what would your answer to that be? Bowman's capsule. Excellent. Identify the tissue type that forms this uh, layer. Simple squamous epithelial tissue. Excellent. And technically, I could ask identify the entire structure. Although honestly, if I'm gonna ask that question, because again, I'm gonna try to be obvious with these things. Uh, what I would likely do in that case is I would likely put a circle around this whole thing. And then when I put that circle around the whole thing, I would say, try to identify, uh, please identify or identify the entire structure uh, inside the circle. And what would that entire structure inside the circle be? The renal corpuscle. Renal corpuscle, excellent, all right. I could move my arrow a little bit. I could move my arrow here and ask you to identify the space. And what would your answer to that be? Bowman space. Or I could move my arrow here and ask you to identify the organelle. And what would your answer to that be? Uh, 
Kidney? Organelle. Not organ, organelle. Nucleus. 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 Yeah, nucleus. Right. Again, that's kind of the thing with the simple squamous. With the simple squamous epithelial tissues, they are often so flat that what ends up happening is the nucleus actually kind of bulges out the top. So it's not uncommon to see the nucleus bulging out of the top of a simple squamous epithelial tissue. We see another one there. We see another one there. We see another one here. So we can see those kind of bulging nuclei sticking out from the simple squamous epithelial tissue. All right, that makes sense. Do we get how the game is played? Yeah. Excellent, so let's do one more. I don't even have to change the slide. Identify the structure. The renal tubule. Renal tubule, excellent. How did you know? I looked at the paper. <laughs> Perfect, exactly. You looked at the paper, you saw it was the very next thing on the list. And since I've been mostly going in order, that was a safe bet. But let's actually see how we would figure this out because you're 100% correct. Notice we see the renal corpuscle. The renal corpuscle is there. So of course, what specimen are we still in? Kidney. Kidney. And remember, specimen, basically, if you think about it, when I'm asking the question specimen, I'm basically asking, what's the label on the slide we're looking at, right? So you would go, if you wanted to look at this under the microscope, you'd find the slide that said kidney on it, and this is what it would look like. So we know we're in a kidney. Here we have a rolled up tube inside of a kidney, so it must be a renal tubule. Now, as you look at this renal tubule, and I'll go ahead and draw on it just so that it's a little bit more clear. Let's move this out of the way. What you notice about this renal tubule is that it is comprised of a single layer of cells. And this view is a little out of focus. I'll show you another in just a minute. But it's basically made up of a single layer of block-shaped cells rolled up into a tube. So I could have that arrow there like I did before and ask you for the structure. And what was your answer for the structure? The renal tubule. The renal tubule. I could also ask you to identify the tissue type. And what would the tissue type be? Simple cuboidal Simple epithelial cuboidal. tissue. Excellent. I could point here and ask you to identify the side or the surface. Apical. Excellent. I could point here, ask you for the side of the surface. Basal. Identify the extracellular material you would find in this location. Basal, Basal membrane. Excellent. Identify the space. Free space. Free space. And this happens to be a rolled up free space. So what else would it be? A lumen. A lumen, mm. excellent. Now, technically, my simple squamous over here, doesn't it also have a basal and an apical surface? Yeah, yeah. it is an epithelial tissue and technically it, it does. However, is it really easy to see that on a squamous tissue? No. no. So notice on something like this where it's cuboidal, it's much, much easier to see. Now let's switch gears. Notice this one's a little bit better in focus. So we can, again, much more clearly see, identify, whoops, let's make that bigger. Identify the tissue type. Simple cuboidal epithelial tissue. Excellent, it is definitely a simple cuboidal epithelial tissue. Uh, and again, uh, oh, see, perfect. I can leave this arrow here and ask at least three questions. Uh, we did the tissue, identify the surface. Apical surface. Apical? Basil. Uh, basil. basil. Identify the extracellular material you would find in this location. Basal lamina. Yep, excellent, perfect. Um, identify the structure. Is that still the renal tubule? It turns out it is still a renal tubule. However, notice in this picture, we don't really see a renal corpuscle anywhere. 
So other than the fact that you and I are sitting here talking, there's no way for you to actually know that this is actually still the kidney. So again, this would be the case where I'd flip this around again. Instead of asking you the specimen in this case, uh, what I would say is identify one location where you would find this tissue and where would your answer to that be? The kidney. The kidney would be fine, yeah. And again, in this case, you could just call it a tubule. You wouldn't necessarily know that it was a renal tubule. So if you just called it a tubule, that would be fine. And again, just to beat the dead horse, organelle. Nucleus. Nucleus. Surface or side. Apical. Space. Lumen. Space. Lumen. Space or lumen. lumen. Excellent. Perfect. All right. Questions on that? Excellent. Identify the tissue type. Stratified columnar epithelial tissue. Now, are you gonna be responsible for stratified columnar on the lab exam histologically? No. No, so what is this? Simple strata, uh, simple columnar epithelial. Exactly. This one's a little bit tricky because this is a case where we have an organ like the stomach that happens to be kind of collapsed in on itself. So what we're actually seeing here is not one simple columnar epithelial tissue, but two. Identify this surface. Basal. Basal. Identify this surface. Basal. Excellent. Identify this surface. Apical. Identify this surface. Apical. Excellent. All right. So basically, we have two simple columnar epithelial tissues that are facing each other. And that means this space in between, what's that? Free space, lumen. Free space or a lumen. Exactly. Excellent. All right, uh, let me erase some of this. Identify the organelle. It's like cell membrane? No. Nope. Kind of looks like it has kind of like the microvilli. microvilli. Microvilli, exactly. These are the microvilli. Remember, some of our simple columnar can have microvilli on their surface to be able to help us to increase our absorption. Excellent. Uh, identify the organelle. Nuclear. Identify the extracellular material you would find in this location. Basal lamina. Excellent. Identify the substance. Is it not on your list? Mucus or mucin? There you go. What's the difference? That's a great question. What is the difference between mucin and mucus? Is mucin the protein that makes mucus? Bingo. Mucin is a protein that is produced by cells. When mucin is mixed with water, then as a result of that, you get mucus. So absolutely, this is a special cell. Uh, it's called a goblet cell because notice it has kind of a big bowl goblet-like appearance to it. And it contains a substance called mucin. Now remember in our last class, we talked about what we called an artifact. Artifact, remember, is a characteristic of the tissue that isn't really there in real life. It's something that we've added to it. And color is almost always an artifact, except when it isn't. And this is a perfect example of this. Mucin, as it turns out, is a protein that doesn't bind to a lot of the stains that we use. So when you have a cell like this that is filled with mucin, it is almost always very, very clear in color. 
right? Notice there's another one right here as well. These cells are cells that are filled with that mucin and it makes them very, very clear in color. So sometimes color, or in this case, lack of color, can actually give us a piece of information. That tells us these big bulbous cells that are clear are what are known as goblet cells. And these goblet cells contain mucin, making mucus. All right. Identify one location where you would find this tissue. Stomach. Stomach, what else? Intestines. All right. Although you want to say small intestine. Small large intestine, intestine, large intestine. intestine. Say, yeah, intestines on the exam. And remember also the distal part of the esophagus as well. Those four locations are where you're going to find your simple columnar epithelial tissue. Again, I appreciate that when you look at the fuzzy top, this may kind of trick you into thinking it may be cilia, it may be microvilli, it may be hard to tell them apart. Cilia are typically larger, but again, notice all these cells are pretty uniform in their shape. All their nuclei are pretty lined up in a row. So this uniformity tells us it is simple columna, right? Here's another simple columnar as well, another goblet cell, all those types of things. But compare that to this one. Here are our nuclei all lined up in a row. No, hodgepodge. Hodgepodge, absolutely. And very long, extensive organelles projecting from the top. So what tissue type is this? Deuterostratified, ciliated, epithelial tissue. You forgot columnar. Remember, you need to have all three. Columnar. Parts. I promise you, eventually, it'll roll off the tongue. You'll be able to say ciliated, pseudostratified, columnar, and it'll just roll off the tongue. Absolutely. All right. So again, surface. Basal. Extracellular material you'd find in that location. Basal membrane. Surface. Apical. Organelle. Cilia. Organelle. Nucleus. One location where you'd find this tissue. Nasal. Nasal cavity. Where was the other one? The trachea. Trachea. Perfect. Excellent. All right. Questions on that one? All right. Just that easily we have done our simple epithelial tissues. So let's switch to our stratified. What do we have here? Stratified squamous. Excellent. Again, notice, and let's pop back. Notice if you just look down here, if you just look down here, these tissues look almost identical. A hodgepodge of nuclei. So where do you look? You look at the top. On the previous one at the top, we had no nuclei and, and cilia. Here, when we look at the top, what do we see when we look at the top of this one? Flat. Hi. Flat cells, excellent. And what do you notice about these flat cells? They have flat nucle uh, nuclei. They have, they have nuclei, excellent. So what type of tissue is this? Squamous. Non-keratinized. Okay, so there you go. You put a, put all of that together. A non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Right? Because remember, the apical layers can have keratin or they can have nuclei. You can't have both. If you have nuclei, that is a non-keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Surface. Inside of the cheek. Uh, well, true, that's a location you would find it, but that wasn't what I was asking. Identify this surface. Apical. Apical. Identify this surface. Basal. Identify the extracellular material you would find in this location. Basal membrane. 
basal membrane, basal lamella, basement membrane, excellent. And now let's answer the question that you already asked the question you already answered. One location where you would find this tissue. Inside, Inside the mouth, where else? Anus. Anus, where else? Esophagus. Beginning of the urethra. Proximal esophagus. Remember, not the entire esophagus, but the proximal two thirds of the esophagus. Give me at least one more. Vaginal canal. Absolutely right. All of these are places that need to protection, need to deal with friction, need to deal with temperature, need to deal with. They're exposed to the outside world, so we want these many cell layers to provide that protection. All right. Compare this to this. Again, different magnification, but notice when we look down here at the bottom, we just see a bunch of hodgepodge of cells. I love that term hodgepodge. I'm gonna co continue to use it. Thank you for doing that. But notice something else. When we look at the cell layers at the top, they are all flattened. But what do you notice about all these flat cells on the top? The nucleus. No nucleus. So these are dead flattened ones. So what type of tissue is this? Keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Excellent. Keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. Excellent. Now, there are three other important things that I want to mention about this. First one, where do you find this tissue? Skin. Skin, absolutely. Now, notice when we look at this one, there's this big, huge gap. These superficial cell layers are just kind of floating in space above the rest of the tissue. Is that what happens with your skin? Do you have a bunch of cells floating on top, just floating in space above the surface of your skin? No. No, of course not. This is a great example of what I was talking about before about that artifact. Remember, these dead cell layers are fused together. They have desmosomes holding them together. Remember, when we burn the skin, it peels off as a single layer. And that's exactly what's happened here. With this skin, when we froze it, when we sliced it, when we mixed it all with the chemicals, it damaged the layers. And so the cells started to separate. But because those superficial layers are so fused and held together, they're kind of floating in space above them. So this is just a simple artifact of it. These are normally right on the surface. And I just this isn't the best picture, but I liked it, so I wanted to have it. I also have this picture for another important reason. And excuse me while I get on my soapbox here. But identify this substance. All this red, hazy, brownish substance down here. Anybody know what that happens to be? I know you know. It's not the basal membrane. No, I'm not, not, mass, not asking for the surface, although that's great. No, what is this substance? Identify this substance, all this dark pigmented stuff down here in the deep layers of our skin. Keratin or melanin? Melanin, exactly. And what does melanin do? Provides color. Yeah, it provides your skin color. Absolutely. This is what the skin, actually, I, I like this picture. And the reason I have this picture, even though it's got this weird artifact to it, is because I think there's a great dichotomy of this. And again, part of it, this is obviously not the way the skin normally is, but what it does show you is an appreciation of kind of what the difference between a darkly pigmented skin and a lightly pigmented skin would be. Someone with very dark skin coloration has this melanin down here in the deepest layers of their epidermis, in the deepest layers of their keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissue. Whereas someone who's very light in skin color has almost no pigment down in this area. And that is it. That is the only difference biologically from someone who is dark pigmented in skin and light pigmented in skin. And when you think of all the malice and strife and uh, even now more amplified over the past four years that have come associated with skin color and all the problems associated with it, when you look at this from a biological standpoint and you see how meaningless these differences is, it is incredibly frustrating to see all the social connotations associated with such an insignificant 
uh, biological variants. It is just incredibly frustrating when you look at these things bio biologically to see how subtle the differences are and how meaningless they are from a biological standpoint and how powerful they've become from a social standpoint. All right, off my soapbox. We'll talk about that more when we get to the skin. But let's talk about the things that you need to know for the exam. Obviously surface. Apical. Apical surface. Surface. Basal. Basal. Extracellular material you'd find in that location. Basal membrane. Basal membrane. Substance. Mm, keratin. Keratin, excellent. All right, uh, perfect. Uh, I think that's good for this one. And the skin, we know is where you would find this. This happens to be thin skin, like what you would see on your arm. However, this would be more like the palm of your hand or the soles of your feet. This is what is known as thick skin. Notice with thick skin, you can have hundreds of layers of flattened, dead, fused together cells. And so notice every single cell from basically here up does not have a nucleus in it. Big, huge, massive, thick layer of dead keratinocytes just filled with keratin. And we can see down here the basal surface, the difference between the cell dense epithelial tissue and the cell sparse uh, connective tissue that is underneath it. We still just have one basal surface. We still just have one apical surface. And then all those layers of keratin, keratinocytes in between those cells making up our skin. All right, excellent. Hey, Professor, I got, I got one question. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if maybe I just spaced out and didn't hear it, but the, the keratin that's going into that, the keratin is going into the bottom layer, then it just obviously forms up as it dies. It kicks out the nucleus and everything like that. Is that, is there something special to transport the keratin to that location? So no, the cells themselves make the proteins. So when we get to the integumentary system, which won't be till you know Thursday, <laughs> we will talk about this in detail, but you absolutely have the right idea. Basically, we start with new cells being formed down here at the bottom. As the cells migrate and are pushed upwards, they make and fill themselves with keratin to the point where basically they have so much keratin in it, they basically chuck their nucleus, chuck their organelles in their dye, and then they basically, as dead fused flattened cells, they provide protection till they reach the top of the skin, at which point they slough off and become the dust in your house. So yeah, so basically these cells live two lives. They make their keratin and then they're basically dead cells providing protection with that keratin. And like I said, when we get to skin, we'll get into this in more uh, details. In fact, we'll see that this one layer of keratin of keratinized stratified squamous epithelial tissues actually has five sublayers to it. And we'll identify those sublayers and what's going on with it and everything that goes along with that. But we'll wait till we get to the integumentary system to do that. All right. Excellent. Tissue type. Transitional. Transitional, excellent. How do you know? I saw the cell up there with two nuclei. There you go. Conveniently enough, we have our dead giveaway. But even if we didn't have that dead giveaway, again, notice as we go from the basal surface to the apical surface, do the cells get bigger or do the cells get smaller? Bigger. 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 So as they move up, if they get bigger, you know you have a transitional epithelial tissue. Because notice whether you're keratinized or uh, non-keratinized, the cells get smaller as we go towards the epical layer with, this, uh, with the stratified squamous, uh, whereas transitional, they get bigger. But yes, also because again, on a lab exam, a time is an issue. So when you see a dead giveaway, like an apical cell with two nuclei, then you instantly know it's a transitional epithelial tissue and you can move on from there. 
Of course, make sure you read the question carefully because the question could instead have been, give me one location where you would find this tissue. And what would your answer to that be? Bladder. Any other correct answers? Ureter. Ureter and the urethras as well. So the ureters, the urethra, the bladder, all of those are places where you would find this tissue. All right, and there you go. That is what you are responsible for histologically for our tissue types. Would you, yeah, on that previous slide, would you possibly ask a question like, oh, is, you know, if this is a bladder, is this full or empty or? No. Okay, just double checking. Yep. No, it's a good question, but no, I wouldn't ask that. All right. Any other questions on then those are, again, we have eight epithelial tissues, but notice there's only six you need to know histologically because you don't need to know the stratified cuboidal and the stratified columnar. However, for stratified squamous, you have to know both keratinized and non-keratinized. So I think technically that makes seven different epithelial tissues you need to be able to identify histologically. What about the glandular one that's on the well, You are absolutely correct. That is where we are going next. So uh, the last thing we need to talk about for our epithelial tissues is remember I mentioned that our epithelial tissues are also going to be what we use to make glands. So we need some gland definitions. We need to talk about glands and then we can see what that looks like histologically. However, uh, it's 9-7, so I think this is a good time for our first break before we dive into the gland stuff. So uh, you are absolutely correct. That is where we're going to go next. That's the last thing we need to know about our epithelial tissues, but we'll save that for after the break. So let's go ahead and take our first break, take a 15-minute break. Uh, that means coming back at 9-22, and 9-22 we will restart, and I will start the recording at that time. So any other questions before we get... Uh, into our first break. All right, excellent. I will see you guys in 15 minutes. Any questions before we dive back in? All right, so the last thing we need to talk about for epithelial tissues, as I mentioned, is that uh, epithelial tissues are also used to form our glands. They line our surfaces inside and out. Uh, they form those barriers. They form those boundaries. They allow for movement of materials inside or outside, diffusion and, and uh, secretion, all those types of things. But they're also used to make our glands. So obviously, the first thing we have to do is define what a gland is. A gland is either a single cell, and there are hundreds of single cell glands found throughout our body or a mass of cells that are adapted for secretion. And when we talk about glands, glands basically come in two main flavors. They are endocrine glands and exocrine glands. So let's talk some definitions here. When I use, say, endocrine, right, often it helps to break this term down. Any idea what endo means? Within. Yeah, it means within. And anyone know what crin means? Let's take any medical terminology classes yet. Or remember this term. It actually means to secrete. Based on that, then what would exocrine gland mean? Exo means outside or outside. And what does crin mean? Secrete. Yeah. So literally the definitions of these two terms are to secrete outside of the body and to secrete inside of the body, right? Uh, give me an example of an exocrine gland. Sweat glands? Sweat. Give me another example. Yeah, that was like the pheromone. <laughs> I'm uh, sorry. Mucosal glands. Which glands? Oh. Muco uh, mucosal. Okay, so like salivary. Uh, nasal cavity. Yeah, mucus glands. But if it's secreting in my nose or if it's a salivary gland secreting in my mouth, 
isn't that inside of my body? No. No, remember what we talked about in the last class, that that lumen of our digestive system, right? Something that is open to the outside of the world, we call the topological exterior. So something like a stomach gland or a mucus gland or a salivary gland are indeed secreting outside of the body. Excellent. Now, the way they do this is typically by having two components. They have the glandular secretion or the secretory portion, but they then also have a duct. Uh, with ducts, right, a duct is kind of like a PVC pipe. You have PVC pipes out in your backyard for your sprinkler system. And does that PVC pipe make the water, modify the water in any way? No, just transport it. It just transports it. And that's basically what a duct use, does. A duct doesn't make the secretion. It doesn't modify the secretion. It just basically carries it outside of the body. This is very different from endocrine glands, which are ductless. I don't know if that's actually a word, but I'm making it one. They release inside the body, and so they secrete and they release them into the interstitial fluid. And of course, once it gets into the interstitial fluid, it almost certainly is gonna end up in the blood. And once we get that endocrine secretion into the blood, where can it go? Throughout the body. Yeah, everywhere in the body, absolutely. And what type of things do these endocrine glands produce that we release into the blood and go everywhere in the body so they can potentially affect every cell of our body? Hormones? Yeah. Hormones. Excellent. So our endocrine glands produce hormones. They are ductless. They secrete into the interstitial fluid, uh, which ends up into our blood. And not surprisingly, we will focus on the endocrine glands when we get to the endocrine system. So for today and for this exam, we are going to focus on our exocrine glands. These are the glands that secrete outside of the body. These are the glands that have ducts. Uh, these are the glands that we are going to focus on. All right, so as long as we have a definition and understand these two, then we can focus on our exocrine glands. Now, not surprisingly, like most of the things we are gonna talk about in the body, we can identify glands two primary ways, the way they're made, their structure, or the way they work, their function. And of course, since the function of glands is to produce a secretion, we can also identify glands by what they secrete. Salivary glands secrete saliva, sweat glands produce sweat so on and so forth, right? So that makes that pretty easy. So when we identify our glands, and let's do this here, we can identify them two, three ways really, but the two ways we wanna focus on right now is we can identify glands uh, functionally, and functionally is gonna be how they release their secretions. and uh, structurally, which is going to be uh, how they are made. Or we can think of it as the parts that form them. Okay. Let's start first with our structural classifications. And again, remember, we're only talking about exocrine glands right now. The first criteria when we are identifying the structural classification of glands is to ask, are they one-celled or many-celled? Because as we talked about, uh, the very first type of structural classification, so let's go ahead and write these over here. is a single-celled gland. Now, 
we actually already saw an example of this. If you remember when we were doing the histology, we saw that goblet cell, that cell that was huge and round and filled with mucin. That was an example of a single celled gland. And like I said, hundreds of them have been found in the body. But many of our exocrine glands are also comprised of multiple cells. And if we have a multi-celled exocrine gland, that multi-celled exocrine gland is going to be made up of two parts. And those two parts are going to be the secretory structures. Secretory structures are of course what make the secretions. and the ducts, and the ducts are what carry it out of the body. Now, the good news is there are rules on how we put these together structurally. When forming glands, uh, first there are two main shapes for secretary structures. Uh, the first of those main shapes is a small ball-like structure. And that small ball-shaped structure we call an alveoli. Well, singular would be alveolus or a sinus. But because anatomists love having fun with vocabulary, the plural of these are alveoli and asini. And these two terms are pretty much interchangeable. Both mean a small ball-shaped secretary structure. The second is a long, narrow, uh, secretary structure, one could even say tube shape because that's what they're called, tubular. So when we talk about our secretary structures, one can be a ball shapes uh, secretary structure and one can be a long narrow tube shaped secretary structure. Now, some tubular uh, glands are long and narrow and straight. Some of them, like a ball of twine, will be rolled up into a ball. So some of these tubular, when they're rolled up into a ball, uh, will be what we call coiled. So they can be coiled or they can be straight. And it's just that simple. The second way, not only do we have to worry about the shapes of the secretary structures, but the second way we identify our multicellular exocrine glands is to identify by the numbers of secretary structures and the numbers of glands. I mean, pardon me, the number of ducts. If a gland has one duct and one secretary structure, then we identify it as being simple. If it has one duct and two or more secretary structures, then we identify it as being branched now your book also uses the term simple branched, but I've always found that confusing. So I just like simple and branched, but if you wanna use simple branched, I'm fine with that as well. I just don't want you to be confused by that. And the third is if you have two or more ducts and two 
or more secretory structures, then we call it a compound gland. There you go. That's it. It is just that simple. So let's put the pieces together and see if we can figure it out. As it turns out, there are eight, oops, that's not an eight, structural classifications for exocrine glands. One is the single-celled gland. So everybody got the rules because I need to erase the screen here. So any questions before I erase the rules? Perfect. Then that means that there must be seven specific types of, of, of multi, oops. Excellent. So there are seven specific, and let's be structural classifications for multicellular exocrine glands. And let's see if we can figure them out. Let's start first by drawing, for instance, the surface of the body. And let's do some drawing. We can talk about their being. Let's do this first, let's cheat. So, first possible structural classification for an exocrine gland. We have one duct that we'll draw in blue. And we have one ball shape secretary structure. Based on the rules, how would you identify this particular gland? A simple alveolar gland. There you go. Simple alveolar gland. Excellent. Conversely, one duct. one long narrow tube shape secretary structure, what would that be? Simple tubular. Excellent. One duct. Three ball shape secretary structures. Branched alveolar gland. Excellent. One duct. Two tube shape, branch tubular, excellent, one duct, one long twisty turny tubular structure, coiled tubular yeah be basically a simple coiled tubular excellent perfect let's draw some more skin or other surface two 
two or more ducts connected to two or more ball-shaped secretary structures. Compound alveolar glands. Two or more ducts connected to two or more long, narrow tube shape secretary structures. Compound tubular. Excellent. How many of these did I say we needed to have? Seven. Seven. How many do we have? Six. Six, right. Because remember seven. these. No, we technically oh, yeah, we, yeah, have, seven, yeah. we have six because these two are basically the same. The only difference is the shape of the tube. So we do need one more. And that one more is going to be two or more ducts. And two or more secretary structures, but some of the stru secretary structures are ball shaped and some of the secretory structures are tube shaped. What do you think we call something that has two or more ducts, two or more secretary structures, but it has both ball and tube shape secretary structures? Compound tubulo alveolar. There you go. Compound tubulo alveolar, all one word. And just that simply, we have identified our seven multicellular structural classifications of exocrine glands. I've done it here on the board very simply. Your textbook does a decent job of doing this as well. Again, here we see our first structural classification, our unicellular gland. Again, notice again, we have that big ball shaped, globular shaped goblet cell that's a little bit clear on the inside. Just out of curiosity, what tissue type is this? Pseudostratified columnar epithelial. There you go, exactly. Ciliated sort of stratified columnar. How did you know? The big old cilia at the top. Yeah, dead giveaway, big old cilia at the top. It didn't hurt that it had the name here next to it as well, but definitely the cilia and the disorganization of the nuclei are a dead, dead giveaway. And not surprisingly, if you think about it, as we were already talking about, our nasal cavity and our trachea are definitely places where we want to make mucus to capture dust and debris. So it's not surprising that we would have goblet cells in there. And there we see the pretty picture of how those goblet cells work. But when it comes to multicellular, we need to know the shape of the secretary structure. We need to know the number of ducts, the number of uh, secretary structures, and we can put them together. Notice here, we see your book's example of a simple tubular with one duct and one, what they're calling tube shape secretary structure, one duct, three tube shape secretary structures for that branch tubular. And again, remember your book uses the term simple branch, which is totally fine. I find it confusing. So I just use branch, but simple branched is fine as well. Just don't put simple tubular. If you put simple tubular for this, you will get it wrong. Make sure you include branched. Here are their alveoli, one ball shape, one duct, simple alveolar, one duct, two or more ball shaped secretary structures are branched alveoli. Here, we have our compound tubular, many ducts, many tubes, many ducts, many balls, uh, compound alveolar, and there's the alphabet soup one that you're gonna have to spell, but it tells you everything about it. It's compound, meaning two or more secretary structures, two or more ducts, but some are ball-shaped, some are tube-shaped. 
So tubulo alveolar, all one word. When we're looking at these things histologically, anytime you see two different types of secretary structures, balls and tubes, you know it has to be a compound tubulo alveolar gland. And we'll look at that in just a minute. Actually, let's do it now while we're thinking about it before we get too far away while it's still fresh. All right, questions on those? Do we need to know where we would find each of those for the exam? Uh, great question, no. So, so for the exam, um, all right, so excellent question. Here's what I would say. Uh, on the exam, is it a possible essay question for you to be able to identify all of the structural classifications of exocrine glands? Yes, absolutely. Uh, however, the other way you're going to be responsible for this information is every single gland we're going to run into, starting first with this first salivary gland we're going to talk about, uh, but then all of the glands of the skin and any gland you will run into for the rest of anatomy and physiology, not only do you need to know the substance that gland produces, but you are going to need to know its structural and its functional classification. So when we get to the skin and we talk about the sweat glands and you learn that the sweat glands are simple coiled tubular glands, you know what that means. And so if I show you a simple coiled tubular gland, you'll know that that must be a sweat gland, right? Or I could ask you, what is the structural classification of a sweat gland? And you would tell me that it is a simple coiled tubular gland. So you don't need to know examples per se, but every gland you walk into from now to the end of anatomy and physiology, you're gonna need to know their functional and their structural classifications. So let's do that. This is going to take a little bit of build up to get to what we need to know on our histology slot, a handout. So don't look at the handout just yet. Uh, think and listen and watch. Here I have, uh, we, as it turns out, again, you are responsible for one of your salivary glands. However, it turns out we actually have three salivary glands, actually six, three pairs of salivary glands. And this happens to be one of them. Now, as I mentioned, when we look at exocrine glands, it's usually pretty easy to tell the difference between the things that are the ducts, because ducts are typically made of simple cuboidal or simple columnar cells. They're rolled up into tubes because as we talked about, they're the PVC pipe that is responsible for carrying this fluid out of our body and being able to distinguish those from our secretary structures. So pretty easily we can tell the difference between the ducts and the secretary structures. Ducts, of course, their job is just to carry the substance and not to make them. The secretary structures make the secretions. Now, in this case, the secretion we're talking about is saliva. And saliva has two parts to it. The first part to it is serous fluid. Remember, we talked about serous fluid when we talked about serous membranes, like the one around my heart. And as we talked about, those reduce friction so that the heart can beep without uh, you know, be, uh, getting really hot or warm, we can reduce the friction. So if I spit on my hands and started rubbing them together, they would be slippery and it wouldn't start to heat up. I wouldn't be pushing, pushing I wouldn't be making that secretion right away. All right, we comfortable with that idea? However, how many of you are older siblings? Any of you? Couple of you, excellent. So for those of you who are over sibling, older siblings, you know that by law, you are required to torture your younger siblings, right? I had three younger sisters that I got, uh, was forced, again, required by law to torture, didn't wanna do it, had to do it. And of course, I'm sure like me, one of the things that you enjoyed doing was kneeling on their chest and dribbling a teeny bit of saliva till it almost touched their noses and then, you were able to suck it back up. 
Now, why are you able to do that with saliva? If it was just watery, serious fluid, would you be able to do that? No. No, because saliva not only is serious fluid, but it also has mucus in it. So there are two parts to saliva, serious fluid and mucus. Now, let's look at all of our secretary structures here. All of our secretary structures here look the same color-wise, and they're very, very clear. Remember, as I mentioned, color doesn't matter except when it does. And this is one of those times when it does. These clear cells, guess what they contain inside of them? Mucin. 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 Excellent, mucin, the protein. That, when added with water, is going to produce mucus. Excellent. So these particular secretary structures make mucus. They make mucin, which is going to become mucus. Now remember, our secretary structures can come in two shapes, uniform ball shapes or tubes. Now, when I drew my drawings of the tube shape, I showed the entire length of the tube. But if you have a tube or a string, for instance, a ball of string, and you cut that ball of string in half, do you see the one single string wrapping around to all the different pieces when you cut that in half? These are the easy questions. When you cut a ball of string in half, do you see just one piece of continuous piece of string? Yes. No. No, of course not. You see all of the bunch of pieces of the cut string because it's a three-dimensional structure that you're cutting just one slice out of. And that's what histology is. If I have a big tube-shaped structure that I cut, I'm not going to see a continuous single tube. I'm going to see some pieces of tube. Some pieces of tube will be cut on a cross section. Some may be cut on a longitudinal section, are gonna be cut at an angle. Some might be cut on the bend. So as I look at these secretary structures, are they all uniform ball shaped things or are they more irregular in their shape? They're gonna be irregular. They're irregular. So as it turns out, these things are tubules that produce mucus. These are our mucus tubules. Now, how many ducts do I have here? Four that are circled. True, four that are circled. But really, after I got to two, did I need to keep counting? No. No. How many secretary structures do I have here? In the entire slide? Yeah. Wow. More than one. After I get past one, do I need to keep counting? No. No. So structurally, oops. Structurally, what would the structural classification do you think of this gland be? Well, it has two or more ducts, two or more tube-shaped structures. So what would this be structurally? Compound. Compound what? Tubular. Tubular. Excellent. See how we did that? Does that make some semblance of sense? All right, let's try a different one. Here, we see a gland. We clearly see two different types of things. Here are our rolled up cuboidal and columnar tissues. Here are our ducts. Here are our secretary structures. Notice here are our secretary structures all clear and white filled with mucin? No. No. So notice these particular salivary glands don't make mucin. Instead, these are the ones that produce our serous fluid. All right. And are these irregular in their shape or are they all fairly uniform in their shape? They're all pretty uniform. 
So these are serious asini. Ball shape secretary structures that make the watery part of our saliva. And how many ducts do we have? Many. More than one. How many secretary structures do we have? More than one. So this would be a compound, a sinar gland. All right. Again, notice none of this is on your lab exam yet, but we're building to this to try to make some sense. So these are the two simple ones. So do these make sense? These don't make sense, then it's just going to get worse from here. All right. Then let's look at the gland you are responsible for. This is an example of the gland you are responsible for. This salivary gland is your submaxillary gland. It makes the majority of your saliva, about 70% of your saliva. And notice, once again, we can clearly see the duct. And we can clearly see secretary structures. But what do you notice when you look at these secretary structures? Like the last two, are they all the same? No, they got both of them. No, notice we have some irregular shaped ones that are very, very clear. What would that clear structure be? Tubular. Yeah, and what does this tubular structure make? Mucus. 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 So this is a mucus tubule that technically makes mucin. But notice we also have darker stained ball shaped secretary structures. What are these darker shaped secretary structures? Alveoli. Alveoli or sinai. Excellent. And what do they make? The watery part of mucus. Yeah, the serous fluid. Excellent. So notice here, I have a gland that makes two things, mucin and serous fluid. It has ducts and two different types of secretary structures. So what would the structural classification of this gland be? So it only shows one duct, but are we to know that there's more than one? Well, you're absolutely 100% correct. There is only one duct, but how many of the different structural classifications of your glands that you have can have two types of secretary structures? Only one. Only one. So do we, once we see two different types of secretary structures, do we even have to bother to count the ducts? No. No. So what is the structural classification of this gland? Compound, tubular, and sonar. There you go, or a VLR, excellent. Compound, tubulo, alveolar. Excellent. So this is the example that you have, that you're responsible for on the exam. Has ducts, has mucus tubules, has serious asini. And this is, like I said, is that submaxillary gland. This is the salivary gland you're responsible for. All right. Questions on that? Can you repeat that one more time? So it has the ducts, has the mucus tubule over the other two? Serious, uh, uh, serious asini. The asini or the alveoli that produce the serous fluid. So two mm -hmm. different types of secretary structures. So it is a compound tubular alveolar and it makes both parts of the saliva. All right. Questions on that? I had a question. Yes. Uh, so would it be possible to have um, secretory glands that are um, tube shaped that also secrete serous fluid? So yes. 
there well not serious fluid no but uh, can tubules produce something other than mucin yes absolutely can serious glands produce something other i mean can alveolar glands produce something other than serious fluid yes so when we get to like for instance different skin glands we still are going to have the tubes we're still going to have alveoli but they will produce different substances but here in a salivary gland in all three of our salivary glands tubules are the only things that produce mucin Alveoli are the only things that produce serous fluid for our salivary glands. And this is the only compound tubular alveolar gland that you're going to see on the exam. So if you see two different types of secretary structures, you know it has to be the salivary gland. And so you know one is mucin and one is serous fluid. Because this will be the only compound tubular alveolar gland you will see on the lab exam. All right, great question. Any others? Uh, the tube for this gland is the cells for that. Is that would that be a simple cubule, uh, cu cuboidal? For the duct or for the glandular structures? The duct. I'm sorry. Uh, this one, I think these are probably well. So actually, if, if you want to be specific, what's actually happening here is you actually have two different ducts side by side. And if you notice, this duct, the first one, the larger one, is actually columnar cells. So you will actually, so again, there can be cuboidal, they can be columnar, and in really, really large glands, and remember this is also where you would find your stratified cuboidal or stratified columnar. But, but in this case, we have a columnar here, and then we have kind of a mashed up duct here where we really don't see the shape of it very well. So this technically is actually two ducts, but we can, the top part of it, we can clearly see it's simple columnar. Okay. okay. All right. Excellent. Any other questions? Perfect. Then let's go. Where do we want to go back here? Those are our structural classifications for our glands. What we need to do now is talk about the functional classifications. And this pretty picture from your textbook shows that there are only three functional classifications we need to be able to identify. So let's talk about those, starting first with this one here. The merocrine. Now, again, anytime I say functional classification, remember what functional classification means. Functional classification means how it releases its substance. Or if we want to be fancy, we can say it is the mode of secretion. So when we say functional classification, we can also say mode of secretion. So our first mode of secretion and this is the one that is most common, is oops, I know it's more common. most common is what we call the merocrine mode of secretion. Now let's look at this simple illustration and see what's happening. Here in the nucleus are where we get the instructions for making the proteins. Transcription takes place and we make a strand of messenger RNA, which goes to the rough endoplasmic reticulum where it is converted into a string of amino acids in translation, where it goes to the Golgi apparatus, where it is bundled up into a vesicle. And then notice this vesicle comes to the surface and it releases that secretion. And what do we call that process where we bring a vesicle to the plasma membrane and release the contents? Exocytosis. Excellent. Basically, the merocrine mode of secretion uses exocytosis. Now, is the cell damaged by this process? No. No. And in fact, that kind of sounds like a silly question, but we'll see why it's not in just a minute. Obviously, a cell is not damaged by this process, and it is something that it can do continuously. Now notice here, we're just looking at a single cell. Here, we see a secretary structure. Notice this would be an alveoli, where it is making the vesicles, releasing the content by exocytosis into the center of the secretary structure. And then it travels out the duct. 
right? So again, the cell is completely unchanged, undamaged by this process. It's something that can be done continuously. And this is how most, so again, this is by far the most common type uh, of mode of secretion. And pretty much everyone we've talked about so far, salivary glands, sweat glands, right? Uh, pancreatic glands, lots of glands use this mode of secretion. All right, questions on that? Excellent. So let's talk about our second functional classification. And let's again look at the pretty picture here and see what's happening. Notice again, we've got transcription, translation, modification, putting the substance into a vesicle. That part is all the same. But notice here, instead of exocytosis, what happens is the vesicles accumulate in the apical portion of the cell. Once that occurs, the apical portion pinches off. And when it pinches off, it releases the apical portion of the cell. which of course is going to occlude our secretion and some of the cytoplasm. Too small. This produces what is typically a more viscous, more organic secretion. And clearly here, the cell is damaged. Now, is the cell destroyed by this process? No. No, it's just lost some of its cytoplasm. So it can repair itself. While it repairs itself, it accumulates more of the secretion and then starts over again. Now, this mode of secretion produces a much more organic type of substance. We talked about sweat glands in the last one, right? If you all got up and ran around the room 16 times, you would all get all sweaty as a result of that because we have these watery sweat glands that produce sweat to lower our body temperature. However, if instead you went to the gym to run around 16 times and you took your shirt off and you put it in your gym bag and you left it in the back of your car for three days, what would happen when you open that gym bag three days later? Thank you. It would stink, absolutely. The reason for that is in areas like our axillary region, like our buccal region, like the thoracic or the anogenital region, areas where we grow secondary hair, we produce a more organic type of sweat, right? This is something we've known for a long time. In ancient times, uh, there was an amazing individual by the name of Michael Jordan, greatest basketball player who's ever lived on the surface of the planet, right? And not only is he a great basketball player, but he's a great salesman. And so one of the big things that everybody wanted to do was be like Mike. You wanted to wear his shoes, you wanted to wear his clothes, and you wanted to smell like him as well. There was a company who paid Michael Jordan to extract some of that sweat from his armpit. Because while that gym bag, when it's been sitting there for three days, reeks because of the bacteria that is feeding off of that organic secretion, the musty organic smell of that gland when it first produces is something that many people find pleasing. So they wanted to take a little bit of Michael Jordan's musk and make an aftershave. So you may not be able to play basketball like Michael Jordan, but you could smell like Mike. And because these special glands produced this more organic type of sweat, they actually call them epocrine sweat glands which is great 
and awesome and fine and dandy. And to this day, they are still called epocrine sweat glands. However, here's the problem. They named them epocrine sweat glands. They talked about them as epocrine sweat glands. They thought they used the epocrine mode of secretion, but it turns out they were wrong. When we get to the skin next week, and by next week, I mean Thursday, we will learn about epocrine sweat glands and they actually use the merocrine mode of secretion. But we still call them epocrine glands. Why? Because anatomists hate you. All right. So we hear you get to these glands when we get to the skin called epocrine glands. They don't actually use the epocrine mode of secretion. In fact, there is no confirmed examples of epocrine glands in humans. Notice I said confirmed. Currently, there is some, uh, a lot of research going on on the mammary glands. For those of you who have been pregnant, right, know someone who's pregnant, right, fed off of your mom after she was pregnant with you, uh, the breasts, uh, the mammary glands produce milk. And there's really two kinds of milk. There is the form milk, which is more carbohydrate rich and more watery. And there is the hind milk which is thicker, more viscous, and has more protein and fat in it. And it is believed that the two different types of milk may use two different modes of secretion. So it is thought that some of the mammary glands may use the epocrine mode of secretion, but they're hesitant about this. They haven't made that, uh, they haven't determined it for certain yet. So until they know for certain, we're not gonna jump on that bandwagon again. So should you take this class, five, 10 years from now, and quite frankly, I don't know why you would. But if you did, by then we may know whether or not they use the epocrine mode of secretion, but we don't know yet. So there are no confirmed examples in humans, but like I said, maybe a uh, memory glands. However, that doesn't mean that they don't exist. Probably the best example of an epocrine gland are the anal glands of dogs. Now you haven't thought of it in these terms, but if you have a dog and a dog meets another dog, what's the first thing he does? Smell each other's rear end. Yeah, they smell each other's butts. Why? Because of these anal glands. These anal glands tell them everything about their health and where they've been and what they've been eating and all of that kind of information they get about the other dog just by this organic viscous secretion that is produced by these epocrine glands. So again, definitely one of our three modes of secretion, one of our three functional classifications, but no confirmed examples in humans. All right, questions on that? All right, that brings us to our third functional classification, holocrine. Again, let's take a look at the simple illustration and see what's happening. Once again, we are making vesicles and accumulating vesicles inside of this cell. But this cell then is also undergoing some process. What process is being illustrated here by our artist? Mitosis. Mitosis, what stage of mitosis? Anaphase. Anaphase, although if you look closely, you'll notice they have their Vs pointing in the wrong direction. You gotta love these, uh, these artistic licenses our artists take some time, but absolutely you've got the right idea. What happens is these cells divide mitotically. They fill up with their secretion. And when they get to the top of this gland, they basically rupture. And when they rupture, not only do they release their secretions that they've accumulated, but they release all of the contents. Now, does this damage the cell? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. This kills the cell. But luckily, we're making more behind it. All right, again, we've got this simple illustration. Notice here, we've got this nice picture from your textbook. Notice again, here we see the cells dividing. And here, they got the Vs pointing in the right direction. 
filling up and releasing not just the secretion, but all of the contents. This produces a very thick, very viscous, very organic secretion. Classic example of this are the quote unquote oil glands of our skin. Of course, we don't have oil glands in our skin. We actually have glands that are called sebaceous glands that produce sebum. But that sebum is that thick, viscous, oily, organic secretion. Why, what does it do for us? What do the sebaceous glands of our skin do for us? Barrier? Yeah, part of it is forming a barrier. It has a little bit of an antibacterial component to it. Come on, if nothing else, for the past year and a half, you've been washing your hands a whole lot more than you were before. And as a result of that, you're constantly washing all those oils off. So what happens to your skin when you have to wash your hands excessively? Super dry. Yeah, they get dry and they get cracked. So it maintains the integrity of the skin. It maintains the integrity of the hair, helps to keep them elastic, helps to keep them pliable, right? So that secretions, the, that oil that is produced helps to maintain the integrity of our skin that way, right? Production and release of this sebum is also controlled by hormones. So when there's a spike of hormones, like for instance, during puberty, one of the things that can happen is this big, huge, thick, viscous, organic material can actually congest and block that, uh, that duct causing congestion. And this is warm, moist, organic material that bacteria love. So bacteria come in here and start feeding. And as they come in and start feeding, it gets red, it gets inflamed. And what do we call that condition? Acne. Acne, exactly. Acne is caused by the congestion of these holocrine glands, these sebaceous glands of our skin, commonly brought on by increases or changes in hormone levels. All right. So there you go. Eight structural classifications, three functional classifications. Questions on that? All right, excellent. With that then, we are done with everything we need to know about epithelial tissues. So what we need to do next is switch gears and talk about connective tissues. But let's go ahead and take our next break. Looks like it is 1022 right now. So we will restart at 1037. And we'll start the recording at that time. Any questions before we take our next break? All right, see you guys in 15 minutes. Time to switch gears from epithelial tissues to connective tissues. Uh, as I mentioned uh, before, uh, connective tissues are the, not only the most abundant and most widely distributed of all the tissues, but they are also the most diverse. You guys have mentioned some types of them before, bone, blood, cartilage, tendons, fat. All of these are examples of connective tissues. So you can see they're incredibly diverse in their structure and also, excuse me, incredibly diverse in their function. And we see that when we talk about their functions. In general, like the name indicates, connective tissues play a role in protection and support, uh, holding and connecting things together, as well as providing energy, providing for our immune response and all types of things along those lines. Now, despite how diverse they are, there are still some characteristics that all connective tissues share. The first is that there is no free surface. Connective tissues are deep tissues. 
So if your connective tissue is showing, please see a doctor immediately, right? Because there should be an epithelial tissue on top of it. Also, connective tissues are not polar. Remember how we talked about with our epithelial tissues, there's an apical surface, there's a basal surface. And if I took that tissue and turned it upside down, it could potentially dramatically change its function. But if I took a little cube out of one of your bones and rotated it 90 degrees and put it back in there, would that really change the function of the bone that was there inside of your arm? or a little bit of your subcutaneous fat and rotate it at 45 degrees and put it back in there, would it change it? No, because it doesn't have a polarity the same way. It doesn't have a top, it doesn't have a bottom, it doesn't have a free surface, it doesn't have any of those types of characteristics to it. Now, like epithelial tissues, they tend to be well innervated, most, course of keyword there being most are well innervated so when you break a bone it hurts right things along those lines however one of the big differences between connective tissues and epithelial tissues is that again most are well vascularized now of course what's the key word in that sentence most most because most means not all one of the ways we can see this is in the way things heal. How well vascularized something is means how well it can get blood to it, which means how well it can get oxygen. Fantasy football's right around the corner, right? A national, the favorite national pastime these days. And if you spend your first round pick on a running back and in the second game of the season, he breaks his femur the largest bone in his body. How long is he out for? The whole season. Well, for a broken bone? A femur? Yeah. Uh, I've never broken a bone, so okay. maybe okay. Eight weeks. three or four months. Yeah. Six to eight weeks, only about six to eight weeks, right? Our bones heal pretty rapidly. So even the femur, the largest bone in your body, typically is going to heal in, a, uh, in about six to eight weeks. Now, again, it depends on the type of fracture. There are skin some variations, but a, a typical transverse fracture heals in about six to eight weeks because blood is very, a bone is very, very well vascularized. However, what if instead he tears his Achilles tendon or he tears the ACL in his knee? How long is he out for then? The whole season. Yeah, then he's out a year, possibly two. And if he tears that cartilage in his knee, how long is he out for then? The rest of his life. Yeah, he's pretty much done playing football, absolutely, right? What's the big difference between those three tissues? The amount of blood they get to him. Bone is very, very well vascularized. It heals very quickly. Your tendons and ligaments are poorly vascularized, have a very low blood supply to them. And your cartilage, is actually avascular. So it heals very, very slowly, if at all. So again, the advantage of having that large blood supply is the larger the blood supply, the faster that's gonna heal, among other advantages as well. All right, again, these are characteristics that all connective tissues share, but as we also talked about, connective tissues are very, very diverse. If we were to talk about the primary definition of an epithelial tissue, we know they're cell dense, we know they line surfaces of the body, All right? Those are kind of the things that make epithelial tissues what they are. And the same thing is true for connective tissues. Connective tissues, no matter how diverse they are, whether they're blood, whether they're bone, whether they're something in between, they are basically composed of three main elements. The first of these, of course, are cells because all tissues need to be made up of cells, but connective tissues are typically cell sparse, meaning there's a lot more room for other stuff. And the other stuff that makes up our connective tissues are protein fibers 
and what we call ground substance. And these two things together, the fibers and ground substance, make what we call our matrix. <clears throat> and it is the matrix that determines the characteristics of the connective tissue. Bones matrix is basically calcium crystals. Blood's matrix is plasma, basically water, All right? And so on and so forth. So what makes a connective tissue a connective tissue is that it has cells and it has a matrix. And that matrix is what makes connective tissues what they are. So let's talk about these three parts. Let's talk about the cells, let's talk about the fibers, let's talk about the ground substance. Starting first about our cells, every single connective tissue in your body is comprised of a pluripotent, or made from, let's say it that way, a pluripotent stem cell. Remind me again what a pluripotent stem cell is? Can make multiple types of cells. Exactly, you can make multiple types of cells. Uh, any of the cells associated with connective tissues, bone cells, cartilage cells, fat cells, right, tendon cells, all the kind of cells for all of our connective tissues, all come from the same pluripotent stem cell called a mesenchymal stem cell. So all of your connective tissue cells all come from mesenchymal cells, pluripotent stem cells that you have in your body all the time, which allows you to replace your blood, heal your bone when it's damaged, make more adipose if you decide to eat 17 cheeseburgers for breakfast, lunch, and dinner every day. Whatever kind of connective tissue you need, we have these mesenchymal cells to make them. Now, as we know, our anatomists like their rules. And so when we talk about cells associated with our connective tissues and cells really in general in the body, they come in two flavors. They are the blasts, which are the immature cells and immature cells are primarily involved in making the matrix. And we have the mature cells or the sites that are involved in maintaining the matrix. And just out of curiosity, which of these do you think are the more active cells? The immature cells or the mature cells? The blasts or the sites? Blast? Yeah, immature cells, absolutely, the blast. It takes more energy to make a matrix than it does to maintain it. <clears throat> the same way that your immature child has a lot more energy than your mature grandparent does, right? We can put these together to make some sense of things, for instance, a fibroblast, what do you think the job of a fibroblast is? Make fibers. And there you go. And fibrocytes are going to maintain them. What do you think a chondroblast does? Chondro refers to, anyone remember? Like hypochondriac? I'm sorry, cartilage. cartilage, exactly. Chondroblasts make cartilage. Chondrocytes maintain cartilage. How about an easier one? Osteoblasts and osteocytes. What are those associated with? Bones. Bones, there you go. Osteoblasts make bone matrix. Osteocytes are the mature ones that maintain the matrix. Adipocytes, what are those involved with? That. Yeah, our fat cells, absolutely. And the list goes on and on. And again, like we know, our anatomists like to throw curveballs, So we have things like macrophages and mast cells and things like that. Uh, but in general, uh, blasts are the immature cells that are gonna make the matrix and the sites are the mature cells that are going to maintain it. So as we look at all of our connective tissues, we need to identify some of the cells that are gonna be associated with them. But as we mentioned, they are cell sparse uh, typically. So that means there's more room for more stuff like fibers. And again, when we're talking about fibers, we are talking about protein fibers. 
Protein fibers provide the strength and the support for our connective tissues. <clears throat> One of the most common types of fibers are what are known as collagen fibers. Collagen fibers are made up of the most common protein found in the body. Collagen protein is the most common protein found in the body. And collagen provi fibers provide that tensile strength. I believe on the first day, I talked about the example of us playing tug of war as a class where I throw half of you on one side, half of us on the other, and we pull on that rope all day long. And no matter how strong and fit we are, we're not gonna be able to tear that rope in half because it resists those tearing uh, forces because it has tensile strength, right? It can't be torn apart. However, that strength doesn't come from it being rigid because once we're done uh, with playing tug of war, I can roll that rope up into a ball and throw it into the trunk of my car. And that's basically how collagen fibers work. Collagen fibers make it so that our skin doesn't get stretched out or damaged, it doesn't tear. Now, are there limits to that stretch, limits to that tear? Yeah. Absolutely. My brother-in-law, his senior year in high school, grew 12 inches. 12 inches is a massive amount of growth in a single year of your life. And so not surprisingly, he ended up stretching the skin on the sides of his uh, abdomen uh, quite a bit from growing 12 inches in a single year, stretched that skin beyond uh, what it was comfortable stretching. And as a result of that, what does he have along his sides? Stretch marks. Stretch marks, absolutely. Uh, pregnancy is another example where stretch marks can occur. That rapid growth causing an increased stretch of those collagen fibers beyond their tensile strength, damaging those collagen fibers, damaging the skin, right? So those things can kind of occur, but it still has a tremendous amount of strength to it. At the same time, I can pinch my skin, pull it away from the surface and let go and it goes back into place because we also have elastic fibers in our skin. Elastic fibers are made up of a protein called elastin. And it provides that strength, that stretchability and that recoil to our tissues so that they can go back to where they were before. Our third most common type of fiber are what are known as reticular fibers. Reticular fibers are also made of the protein collagen, but they have a different arrangement. If you remember when we were talking about chemistry, one of the things we said about collagen fibers is they're basically made up of three long coils of alpha helixes in that rope-like fashion. Well, reticular fibers are also made up of the collagen protein, but instead, they form short, very elaborately branched fibers. This makes for a very soft, very porous tissue. And this soft, very porous tissue has a lot of space inside of it. So for instance, you find it in places like the liver or places like the lymph nodes. It forms a very soft, compact, uh, spongy almost type of tissue with these reticular fibers. So these are examples of some of the fibers, the most common types of fibers uh, you can find. However, there are more. And the same thing is true for our ground substance. Ground substance is basically the water and the stuff that is dissolved in the water that is contained and surrounds the tissue. Basically, it holds the tissue together. Because it contains a large amount of water, this is also where the exchange of materials take place, where things can leave the tissue into the blood or from the blood into the tissue. So this is how we get rid of waste or we take on nutrients. And this ground substance contains a lot of stuff. Like I said, water is a big part of it, but we also know there's all those ions 
that we talked about that are unequally distributed, large amounts of sodium, small amounts of potassium, and so on and so forth. But there can be some other stuff in that ground substance as well. Big, huge polysaccharides that can be there for storage of energy, but remember also those sugars can be sticky, helping to hold things together. That's important, for instance, in our cartilage. There can also be some really interesting proteins. One example is a protein called fibronectin. Fibronectin is a protein fiber that is actually water soluble. After all, blood is supposed to be a connective tissue, which means it must have fibers in it. However, if you were to pour a bucket of blood out of your body, would you see fibers in it as you were pouring it out? No, but as you let that blood sit there in that bucket for a while, what would start to happen? Coagulate. Yeah, it would coagulate or thicken, it would harden. And that's because what happens is when our tissue is damaged, uh, that fibronectin actually comes out of solution, helping to form this mesh-like structure that is gonna form the clot that stops the blood loss, forms the scab and allows the healing to take place. Your book does a good job of rattling off all of the different components of the ground substance that can be there. I think rather than sitting here and rattling them off, I think it makes more sense to talk about them as we discuss the different tissues and as their functions of those tissues become relevant, we can talk about them that way. Now, when it comes to our connective tissues, unlike our epithelial tissues, where we have the simple and we have the stratified, there really isn't any good way to categorize our connective tissues. So rigidity is as easy as a way to define it as, uh, as any others. And when we look at the main types of connective tissues, there are basically five. There is bone. So let's do it this way. Five main types of connective tissue. Those include bone, cartilage, dense connective tissues. Dense connective tissues are also known as fibrous connective tissues. So a tissue that is a dense connective tissue, guess what it is densely packed with? Fibers. Fibers, which is why it's also called a fibrous connective tissue. A loose connective tissue, and then blood. Now notice I did say five main types because for instance, there are two specific types of bone and three specific types of cartilage, et cetera, et cetera. So as we look at these main categories, we will also see some specific types as well. So let's take a look at some of these. Starting first with bone. And again, we are talking here about bone connective tissue. We are not talking about bones like the radius or the ulna or the humerus that are organs in our body. That's a little bit confusing because obviously the bone that is my humerus, that organ, is primarily made up of bone connective tissue but there are other tissues associated with that as well. And if you get confused by all of that, then it is perfectly acceptable to refer to bone connective tissue as simply osseous tissue, because that's what it means. As I mentioned, there are two specific types of bone connective tissue. For this exam, I am only going to hold you responsible for compact bone. Next week, when we start the skeletal system, you will learn more about compact bone and you will also learn about spongy bone. But for now, we are just gonna get the basics of compact bone and identify that when we're talking about it as a generic connective tissue. This tissue you see over here in the light microscopy is compact bone. And the easy way you can identify it is because of these circle-like, tree trunk-like organizing structures. 
these organizing structures are what are known as osteons. So compact bone is made of organizing structures called osteons. Way too big, way too small. Excellent. Notice osteons are made up of layers of that matrix, that calcium crystal salt, and they surround a space in the center, and that space in the center is known as the central canal. So here at the center of our osteon, we have a space called the central canal. Any idea what might be in that central canal? Bone marrow? Not a bad guess. Bone it, marrow is contained inside of the organs out of the bone, but they're truly to the center of the bone. In this case, the central canals are much, much smaller than that. They contain blood vessels and nerves. Because as we said, bone is very, very vascular. It heals very rapidly. It also hurts like heck when you break that bone. So there's a lot of nerves and a lot of blood vessels in there. Now, as we also mentioned, this is a tissue and it needs to be made of cells. These cells, the mature cells, remember we call osteocytes, and their job is to maintain the matrix. And they, so they need to be surrounded by the matrix. But that's part of the problem. Part of the problem is bone has a solid matrix, right? Bears live in mountains. And if the bear is gonna live in the mountain, then that mountain has to have a cave where the bear can live. And that's what we see here. If we look at our osteon, what we can see as we look at our osteon is there are these small little caves. These small little caves that we see are the spaces where the osteocytes live. And we give these spaces a name. So those osteocytes live in a lacuna. Lacuna being the singular, lacunae being the plural. And again, as I mentioned, technically you do get one letter in this class, so you could spell it either way and still get it right but eventually it'll be nice to tell the difference between the plural and the singular. So bears live in, cage, in caves, osteocytes live in lacunas or lacunae. And I think that's it. Is there any, anybody have their connective tissue handout readily available? Is there anything else on bone there that we need to know? Do I have it all right, or does nobody have their connective tissue hand up? Don't make me waste the time. Look. I'm sorry? Can you repeat the question? So I, th I think I, I wanted to make sure that on your connective tissue handout that I have identified all of the histology anatomy you're responsible for on that, like the lacuna, like the osteocyte, like the osteon, and all of those things. Is there anything else on that list that I didn't mention? And the central canal, I think those are the things. Was there anything else on that list? I don't think we went over uh, histamine granules. That's not in the bone though. Oh, sorry. I don't see anything else on the, on the bone. Okay, excellent. All right, yeah. When we get to the areolar tissue, we'll talk about the histamine granules, but uh, for bone, okay, perfect. I just wanted to make sure we covered all of it. Excellent. Because this is a good histology view of that. So there we go. Uh, as I mentioned, our bone is bone because of its matrix. Its matrix is primarily calcium salts, calcium crystals, but also has collagen fibers in it, right? And again, you may not have thought of it in those terms, but I know you're aware of it. 
because one of the things that happens to our bones as we age is we get more and more calcium crystals added to them, right? You can actually hold a newborn baby at chest height, drop them, and they will actually bounce right back into your arms. Right? Okay, not really, that doesn't really happen. Don't drop babies. However, uh, again, not gonna put anybody on the spot, but I'm sure at one time or another, someone has been changing a baby's diaper, looked away for a moment, and that baby is rolled off the changing tables. Plenty of babies roll off of plenty of changing tables, and typically are the babies hurt by that? They're upset, they cry, but typically is a baby hurt if it rolls off the changing table? Again, you don't have to admit no. having a baby roll off the no. changing table to answer that question. No, because their bones are mostly collagen fibers. They're flexible, they have give, right? But if you hold grandma at chest height and drop her, does grandma bounce back into your arms? No. No, if grandma rolls off the changing table, does she get hurt? Breaks a hip. Yeah, grandma shatters, exactly, because most of her bones are ossified. They don't have the same flexibility, the same give. Again, none of your bones should be showing, but most of you hopefully still have at least one real tooth in your mouth. And if you have at least one real tooth in your mouth, you have enamel on your teeth. That enamel is actually made up of the same crystals that make the bone. Right. However, they don't have the collagen fibers in them, so they don't have the flexibility. They don't have the give. So when you're eating that big bowl of clam chowder and you bite onto a clam shell, does the enamel of your teeth have any flexibility, have any give? No. No. And so you could end up chipping a tooth as a result of that. All right. It's the hardest substance produced by the body. But the difference between your enamel and your bones is your bones have a little bit of flexibility. They have a little bit of give because they have those collagen fibers in them. All right, that is bone. Let's talk about something similar. And that similar thing is cartilage. Cartilage also has a solid matrix, just like bone. Right. However, its matrix has more collagen fibers and it doesn't have the crystalline matrix. It has a lot of polysaccharides, glucosamines, other types of substances like that, which while a solid matrix gives it a little bit more flexibility, gives it a little bit more give. Now notice with a solid matrix, that means we still need a space for the mature cells to live. And that's what we see here on our illustration or in our light microscopy. Here is a mature cell. And of course, what would we call a mature cartilage cell? A site. Yep, and in this case, a chondrocyte. And that chondrocyte, because there's a solid matrix, needs a cave to live in. And so what do we call the cave these, in these solid matrices that the cells live in? Lacuna. Yeah, it's still going to be a lacuna, exactly. Lacuna, again, being the singular. Oops. And lacunae being the plural. So in bone, osteocytes live in lacunas or lacunae. Here, chondrocytes live in lacunae. Both have a solid matrix. Both then need a space, that space is lacuna, where their sites, their mature cells can live. Now, as I also mentioned, there are three specific types of cartilage. And the way you're going to tell them apart is by the matrix. All three types of cartilage are going to have lacunas. All three types of cartilage are going to have uh, chondrocytes in their lacunas. So what we want to do is look at the matrix. This matrix here, notice, is all uniform 
It is all clear, all basically one color. It is filled with fibers, elastic fibers and, cartilage and collagen fibers, but they're all dissolved in the matrix. And it gives it a very clear and a very uniform matrix. This type of cartilage with the clear uniform matrix is called hyaline cartilage. Anyone know where you might find hyaline cartilage on your body? My ears or nose? Close, got one of those right, nose, right? Up here at the bridge, I don't mean the tip of your nose, this is just fibrous connective tissue. This is the bendy flexible part. But if you feel up here where your bridge of your nose is, give that a squeeze, right? Is it very bendy? Is it very flexible? No, it feels pretty hard, pretty rigid. It is a fairly stable tissue. The other place you have it, a common place you have it that hopefully you're not seeing too often is at the end of your bones where you form a joint. Like I said, hopefully that you're not seeing that on yourself, but, oh wait, today's the 15th. Is Cal I didn't look this morning. Is California back open now? Do we all get to run around naked outside now because uh, it's the 15th and everything's better again? Did anybody look? Anybody wake up? Yes. I know that's what's supposed to happen. So excellent. Now we can all run around naked again. And of course, now that we get to run around naked again, the first place you're gonna wanna go is to a Renaissance fair. And when you get to the Renaissance fair, there's many reasons to go, but one of the main ones is that big, huge turkey leg. And when you look at the end of that big, huge turkey leg, there's that white rubbery stuff at the end of the bone. That white rubbery stuff at the end of the bone, that's the hyaline cartilage that helps to form the cushions in the joints where we walk. But notice someone mentioned the ear. If you feel the bridge of your nose and you feel your ear, do those feel the same? No, very no. flexible. This one is much more flexible in the ear. And that is because it is a second type of cartilage, what is known as elastic cartilage. Elastic cartilage, notice, has lacunas, has chondrocytes, but the difference with the elastic cartilage is it has so much elastic fibers in it that you can actually see them with the naked eye. So when we look at these under the microscope, well, not the naked eye, but when we look at it under the microscope, we can actually see these dark, distinct elastic fibers. And these dark distinct elastic fibers are what give your ears their flexibility, their movement. Anybody know any, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was gonna say, is that the same as the, the tip of the nose? Is that the same? No, the tip of the nose is just a fibrous connective tissue. There's actually no cartilage there. The very tip of the nose doesn't have cartilage. Uh, there's a couple cartilage plates. And then, like I said, the septum can be part of cartilage. The bridge can be part of cartilage, but no. There is, though, one other place you find this elastic cartilage. Instead of rubbing your ear, put your hand on your throat and swallow. What happens when you put your hand on your throat and swallow? Your Adam's apple? Yeah, you feel your little Adam's apple bobbing up and down. That Adam's apple is part of an organ uh, we call the larynx. Here we see the larynx. This bump of the larynx right here is uh, your Adam's apple, that's that bump. And what happens when you swallow is there is this piece of elastic cartilage called the epiglottis. And when we swallow and the larynx moves up, the epiglottis folds down over the top of the larynx, which sits on top of the trachea, so that whatever you're swallowing goes into your esophagus and doesn't go into your airway. Right. That's why if you try to talk while you're swallowing or laugh while you're swallowing, things can go down the wrong pipe. This is what's supposed to help to keep things from going down the wrong pipe. So this little rubbery structure here known as the epiglottis is also made up of elastic cartilage. Bendable, flexible. But as we also talked about, also a vascular which is why if you wrestled in high school, 
many people who wrestled in high school and on into college end up damaging the cartilage of their ears, right? It can take years uh, for it to heal properly, but do they wait years before they wrestle again? No, so they're constantly damaging, constantly breaking it and re-breaking it until it gets to the point where it starts to clump up and become scar-like. And what do we call that condition? Cauliflower ear. Cauliflower ear, right? Some wrestlers can have very, very distinct cauliflower ear as a result of it. I wrestled in high school and I still actually, and that was 115 years ago, but I still have a teeny bit of cauliflower in my ear as a result of that as well. So some asymmetry in the sides of my head because of that cauliflower, because of that uh, slow process by which uh, cartilage heals because it is a vascular. Now, there is a third type of cartilage. That third type of cartilage is what is known as fibrocartilage. Notice this is a higher magnification view because they wanted to show it to us. Notice we still have a lacuna. We still have a chondrocyte in here. However, with fibrocartilage, it has a massive amount of collagen fibers in the matrix. These collagen fibers, unlike the elastic ones, tend to run parallel. And so notice it tends to give the tissue a much more wavy appearance. The advantage of all these collagen fibers is that this tissue helps to resist compression. One of the primary places where you find fibrocartilage is in your vertebral discs in between the vertebrae. Let's cheat and go back to this picture. Notice here are the bones of the vertebrae and in between the bones of the vertebrae, we have these intervertebral discs that are made up of fibrocartilage, resist compression, right? These are your shock absorbers. Anybody driven in a car without shocks on it before? rough ride. Yeah, very, very rough ride. You feel every bump of the road. Well, every time you walk or change positions or jump or run, do you want your brain being bounced around in the, your skull like that without shock absorbers? No, of course not. So having these intervertebral discs help to support and cushion the brain as you move around in space. Another place you find this fibrocartilage, oops, oops, wrong direction, is in the pubic symphysis. Uh, I don't have a picture. Clever, but apparently not that clever. Yeah, we'll use this one. The pubic, okay, excellent. So here we see in this picture, again, another example of those intervertebral discs that are uh, the fibrocartilage between the vertebrae providing that cushion. But notice up here in the front of the pelvis, there is a joint where the two bones come together called the pubic symphysis. And this pubic symphysis is also made of fibrocartilage. This fibrocartilage here is very important because females get the honor and the privilege of passing a basketball through their pelvis, right? 
they get to give birth, the honor and privilege of giving birth, and passing a basketball through your pelvis is not easy. So one of the things that happens to females as they're pregnant is the hormones that are produced loosen that cartilage of the pubic symphysis, making it much more flexible, making it much easier for the baby to be passed. Of course, the pelvis provides our center of balance for walking and things along those lines. So as it loosens, typically women who are pregnant, especially late term pregnancy, tend to get a very distinctive gait to the way they walk, right? Notice I didn't say waddle, right? To the way that they walk as a result of that because of that loosening of the pubic symphysis. So those are all examples of things that are uh, made up of fibrocartilage. All right, so cheat and come back here. Questions on these three? Excellent, stun silences, always a good sign. Let's talk then about our dense or our fibrous connective tissues. Remember they are dense because they're packed filled with fibers. Uh, so again, that makes it easy to identify. Uh, they have very few cells because they have so many fibers. They also typically are poorly vascularized. So they don't heal quite as easily as some of the others. And again, we'll say typically because there is an exception. So when we identify our fibrous or dense connective tissues, you may identify them each way or put them together, dense fibrous connective tissues. You are gonna identify them one of two ways. First is by the type of fiber that they are filled with. And the second is the orientation of the fiber. We'll put this over here in the corner here for a second while we look at our first one. Our first one is a dense regular connective tissue. With a name like regular, what do you think the orientation of the fibers are? Regular? <laughs> yeah. What does that mean to have a regular orientation? Well, in this case, it basically means that they're mostly parallel. And notice we see that when we look at both the illustration and the light microscopy. When we look at these, we can see that for the most part, they're all traveling in the same general direction, all the fibers to them. These form very strong rope-like connective tissues, which as we talked about, have a massive tensile strength. meaning that as these fibers line up, they have the ability to resist the massive forces that are pulling on them. These form things like tendons and ligaments. We've used those terms a couple of times now, so let's be more specific. What is the difference between a tendon and a ligament? How do we define a tendon? Uh, it's attaches to the ACL, so bones. Touches bones to what? Other bones. No, but tendon. Uh, okay, now it's ligament. There you go. <laughs> to muscles. Muscle there you bone. go, excellent. Tendons attach bone to muscle, whereas you have the right idea. What do ligaments do? Bone to bone. There you go. So like you said, the ACL, anterior cruciate ligament in your knee, attaches bone to bone, whereas your quadricep tendon attaches your quadricep muscles, that big, huge anterior muscle group on the anterior part of your leg, to your tibia, to your lower part of your leg, the bone in your lower part of your leg. Your quadricep muscles are massively strong. Your tendon is massively strong. In fact, it is possible, again, you're not gonna do this on a regular workout, but 
physically, it is possible to generate enough force in your quadricep muscle where when pulling on the tendon, you would break your lower leg. And that's exactly what would happen. You would break the bone before you tore that tendon off of the bone because the tendons are that strong. Now, if tendons and ligaments are really that strong, then how is it that people damage them? Uh, usually going in the opposite direction that they're supposed to be. Exactly. Notice having all of these parallel fibers gives that tendon and ligament a tremendous amount of strength, but only at the orientation that those fibers are located. So instead, if you're a running back and some linebacker comes running in from the side to tackle you, or you turn your ankle twisting the ligament at some torquing angle against those, then yes, it is possible to tear them. So tendons and ligaments give us tremendous strength, but just along the orientation of those fibers. Very important, very useful forming those tendons and ligaments. But would we want those necessarily in our skin where we can get stressed in all sorts of different directions? No. no. So exactly. So these are very, very important, very, very useful in their orientation, forming ligaments, forming tendons. They also form a third structure as well, an aponeurosis. Does anybody know what an aponeurosis is? It's okay if you don't, it's a weird term. I just was curious. An aponeurosis is basically a broad, flat tendon. If you've ever looked at a muscle uh, image of the body, you see this big, broad, flat, white tendon that goes across the, the top of your head, or a big, broad, flat tendon over your abdominal muscles. Those big, broad, flat tendons, a big, broad, flat tendon is just called an aponeurosis. So again, just means a big, broad, flat tendon. All right, useful for a lot of things, but it isn't gonna help us in our skin. So on our skin, we have a dense irregular connective tissue. In this case, it is also chalk filled with collagen fibers and elastic fibers, but mostly collagen fibers. And these collagen fibers are at all sorts of different orientations. By having them at all sorts of different orientations, it protects us from multi-directional stress. So notice when we look both at the light microscopy and the illustration, some, when we cut a single section out of it, some of these we're gonna see longitudinal sections of, some will be completely cross sections, some will be oblique sections, because there are these fibers at all these different orientations that when we cut it through, we see all the different pieces of. And there is a third type, uh, and again, found in the dermis of our skin. There is a third type of fibrous connective tissue called an elastic connective tissue. As the name indicates, unlike dense regular and dense irregular, elastic is chalk filled with elastic fibers. And these elastic fibers are mostly parallel. Now, I want you to notice something. So far as we've been going through the connective tissues, one of the nice things about connective tissues are all of the connective tissues look very, very different from the others. So when it comes to histology, these things look pretty distinct. It's pretty easy to tell them apart. Here is the only exception. The only exception to this is our dense regular connective tissue and an elastic connective tissue. These are similar, but there are two and a half, three ways we can tell them apart. Notice both are made up of collagen fibers that are basically running parallel. But one of the biggest and the easiest ways to tell them apart 
is to look at the cells. Notice these cells are the cells that make and maintain the fibers. So what would they be? Exactly, Samuel's got it on the nose. What would these cells be? If they made the fibers, what would the cells be? Fibroblasts. Fibroblasts. If they maintain the fibers, what would they be? Fibrocytes. Now, if I point my arrow at this one right here, can you tell which that is? Is that a fibroblast or a fibrocyte? No, I'm asking, really. Can any of you tell them apart? Because I can't. No. And nobody else can either. So remember how we use terms like uh, site and blast to talk about the mature cells and the immature cells? Well, this is the one exception. When we're talking about these dense fibrous connective tissues, when we're talking about fibroblasts, people use the term fibroblast and fibrocyte interchangeably because nobody can tell them apart. We, we don't know which ones are making the fibers and which ones are maintaining the fibers. So sometimes you'll see them use fibrocytes, sometimes you'll see them use fibroblasts. The terms are completely interchangeable. But as Samuel pointed out, notice with our dense regular connective tissue, the nuclei are big, they're elongated, and they're parallel to the fibers. Whereas notice in our elastic tissue, the nuclei are very small and very pinprick-like. They are not elongated, they're not enlarged, they're not parallel. So that is one of the main ways you can tell them apart. The other two are more subtle. Again, this illustration doesn't show it as well, partly because they used a different magnification to them. But typically the college, pardon me, the elastic fibers tend to be larger and more coarse. When we look at the, co the connective tissues histologically, uh, we'll see that these tend to be larger. And actually, let's go ahead and do that now. This will be easy. There we go. Here is our dense regular connective tissue, right? We see parallel cells, pardon me, parallel fibers, elongated nuclei of our cells. So this is a dense regular connective tissue. This one is also a dense regular connective tissue. Notice we can't see the fibers as well in this one, but I like this one because the nuclei, those fibrocytes or fibroblasts are so obvious and so distinct. Very easy to see those big elongated nuclei, which is a dead giveaway you were looking at a dense regular connective tissue. Here is our elastic connective tissue. Notice again, the dead giveaway is the shape and size of the nuclei. They're smaller, they're pinpricks, they're not elongated. But notice here, we can see the, the fibers are thicker and more coarse. Again, it's a little bit more of a subtle characteristic, but it can be a way to distinguish them. And this slide doesn't show it, but if you want a dead giveaway, Sometimes with some stains, the elastic fibers take on a yellowish coloration. Notice this particular stain doesn't show us the nuclei at all, but what we clearly see are large, coarse, yellow fibers. And if you see yellow fibers, that is a dead giveaway you are looking at an elastic connective tissue. So these are the only tissues that can be tricky, but it's still easy if you know what to look for. Yellow fibers, dead giveaway. If the fibers aren't yellow, then are they coarse fibers or are they more fine, smooth fibers? Are the nuclei large and elongated or are they small pinpricks? And if you focus on those things, you should hopefully be able to tell these two tissues apart. All right, questions on that?
Not on. Excellent. So then the only other question we have to ask is where do you find these elastic connective tissues? Well, you find these elastic connective tissues in things that need to be able to expand or things that have elasticity to them. Like the illustration shows, there are many small elastic ligaments that help to hold our vertebral column in place, giving it its flexibility, giving it its give. In fact, our largest elastic ligament is located on the back of your neck. Find the back of your head, and on the back of your head, you should feel a bump. Everybody feel that bump on the back of your head? That bump on the back of your head is actually where that elastic ligament, known as the ligamentum nocha, because it's the nocal region of the body, attaches. And its job is to help to hold your head up. If that bump is really big, that means you fell a lot of uh, sleep a lot in elementary school. And as you fell asleep in elementary school, that ligament had to pull your head back up and that bump gets bigger, All right? So that, that is that ligamentum nocha. Uh, but another location where you find elastic connective tissue is in your arteries. Arteries need to be able to expand and contract to uh, accommodate blood as it is pumped into it. So that is another place where you find this elastic cartilage. So elastic cartilage is where we need this kind of flexible elastic tissue. All right, excellent. Questions on that? Would this be found in the stomach also? Great guess. The stomach would make sense to be there. The uterus would be a place where it would make sense to have those because those are things that definitely need to expand a lot. But it turns out, no, those aren't areas that have them. We would expect them there. That would make sense to put them there. But no, it turns out they're not there. Totally would make sense, right? But, uh, but nope, not found there. Great guess, though because it does totally make sense. But again, as I said, part of the challenge, why things are is one of the challenging questions in a class like this. Because as I mentioned, the engineer who designed all this didn't leave us her footnotes. So we don't always know why. And those are totally places where it makes sense, but it's not there. All righty. From the dense connective tissues, we move to the loose connective tissues. Loose connective tissues are loose because they have fewer fibers in them. And because they have fewer fibers, they have more space inside of them. And that more space makes them more loose. And when there's more space, that also means there's room for more stuff, including more cells. Now, the most common connective tissue and remember the connective tissues are the most common tissues in the body, is this fella right here, what we call aureolar connective tissue. So if I'm asking you for a tissue on the exam and you don't know what it is, guess areolar because it's the most common. If I were to randomly reach into your body and pull out a tissue, period, it is most likely gonna be areolar connective tissue. It is the most widely distributed of all the connective tissues, which are the most widely distributed tissues. Now, what can be tricky about the areolar connective tissue is it doesn't always have this appearance. But when it does, it is a dead giveaway that you are looking at an areolar connective tissue. Notice we see all sorts of fibers at all sorts of different orientations inside of this, giving it a very loose kind of cobwebby appearance. Doesn't always have this cobwebby appearance, but if you see this cobwebby appearance, you know it is an areolar connective tissue. This areolar connective tissue has a lot of space inside of it. It is kind of the bubble wrap of the body where we wrap it around things to stabilize things and hold them in place. Notice in the illustration, there is tons of room for tons of stuff. So we have elastic fibers and collagen fibers and all sorts of different types of cells inside of it uh, that we can find and identify. Good news is you'll only be responsible for one of those, and we'll talk about that later. 
But notice also, if I were to on the exam point an arrow here and ask you to identify the substance, notice I'm not pointing at a fiber. I'm not pointing at a cell. So what am I pointing at? Stuff. Yeah, but let's give that stuff a name. It, you're right, it is stuff. It's not a space. There is something in that space. And what would that something be? If only we knew about a third thing that makes up connective tissues. Is it a ground substance? Ground substance. That would be the ground substance. And remember, ground substance is mostly water and the stuff dissolved in water. This is important because notice there's a lot of space for water. So for instance, if because when class is done today, as I mentioned, I don't have to teach tomorrow. So I get all excited. So I go running to my car so I can drive to the airport and fly to Vegas for the, for the day. And I accidentally slam the car door on my hand, injuring that tissue. And what will happen is the blood vessels in the area will dilate. Uh, the blood vessels in that area will become more leaky. And a lot of excess fluid will come out of those and fill up this space inside of my realar connective tissue. And what do I call that process when it occurs? Swelling. Swelling. Of course, isn't there an appropriate anatomical term, fancier term for swelling? You're 100% right, it is swelling. But if we want to impress grandma, we don't go, hey, grandma, I have swelling. We go, hey, grandma, I have- Edema. Edema, exactly. Right. And think about it. Is there really a part of your body that when you damage it, it's not going to swell as a result of that? Not many, which just shows you how much a real art tissue there is all over the body. Because when you damage a tissue, that fluid is going to swell in that a real art connective tissue, forming that edema. All right. Now, notice another thing about this realar connective tissue. It has all sorts of cells in there, including a couple adipocytes, a couple fat cells. Well, one of the things that can happen, like for instance, in our subcutaneous area, which starts out primarily as a realar connective tissue, we can start to accumulate massive numbers of adipocytes in that area. And basically, when we have an areolar connective tissue that fills up with adipocytes, well, then we end up with our adipose connective tissue. Adipocytes are something we'll find in most parts of the body. As we look at things histologically, you'll find the random cell here or there. And adipocytes are really, really easy to identify. These are big bulbous cells. This tissue kind of looks a little bit always like chicken wire to me. And basically what an adipocyte does is an adipocyte has a vesicle that it basically fills with oil, basically forming an oil droplet. And this oil droplet expands. Now remember, we get color uh, when we look at things under the microscope by putting stain on it. And almost all stains that we use are not absorbed by the oil. So when we look at these things under the microscope, they are crystal clear. Not because they're empty, but because the oil droplet inside of them doesn't take any of the stain, leaving it clear. And notice one other thing, this oil droplet, this fat vacuole fills the cell up so much, it basically pushes all of the organelles, including the nucleus to the side. So basically it fills up the cell and the nucleus, like you can see here, you can see here is basically shoved to the side. They kind of call this a diamond ring type appearance. So notice you never see the nucleus just smack dab here in the middle of an adipocyte. It's always shoved to the side by that big, huge fat vacuole 
filled with oil. And of course, what is the function of these adipose tissues? Uh, like protection, absorb. Uh, yeah, insulation, temperature insulation, regulation, protection. Energy. Energy, yeah, absolutely, right? We always think of adipose as a bad thing because we commonly think of it of just being that subcutaneous fat that changes the way we look. And of course, as we know, nothing in life matters more than how you look, right? But, and again, hopefully you know when I say these things, it's completely tongue in cheek. However, there are people who are very concerned about the way they look, so they'll go on the popcorn diet where they eat one piece of popcorn for breakfast, one piece of popcorn for lunch, and a very reasonable three pieces of popcorn for dinner. Now, if you were to do that for a few months, would you lose weight as a result of it? Yeah. Yeah, not in a healthy way. In fact, when you starve yourself, your body actually goes into protective mode where it wants to hold on to the adipose and you're much more likely to break down muscle, for instance, and be losing that weight that way. However, if you continued to do that for weeks and weeks and weeks, or if you had one of those uh, stomach banding surgeries or something along those lays where you did something extreme where you lost a hundred pounds in a month, Right? One of the things that your doctors will do is monitor you very, very closely. The reason for that is while everybody's happy about losing the fat on the outside, there's a lot of important fat on the inside. One of those important fats is a fat capsule that holds your kidney into place. Your kidney is held in place by a pocket of fat that protects it and holds it into place. And if you go on some kind of extreme diet, where you're losing massive amounts of weight really rapidly, your body doesn't have the time to shift that fat around. Fat movement, lipid movement is very dynamic in the body. But if it's massive weight loss, then it doesn't have time to do that. And what can happen is you can lose that fat pocket for your kidney and your kidney can actually start to sag in your abdominal pelvic cavity. It's a condition we call a ptosis. All right. What happens with that ptosis is that what can happen is that as a result of that sagging of the kidney, you can actually get a kinking of your ureter as it sags down. And what happens when you kink a hose? It doesn't flow very well. Yeah. One thing that happens is you stop urine from flowing out into the bladder. But the other thing that happens is you start to build up the pressure backwards into the kidney. So when people aren't shows like the biggest loser or they have these extreme weight loss surgeries, one of the things the doctors do is they watch their urine output very, very closely because a drop in their urine imp output could indicate a, one of these toses, which can be permanently damaging to the kidney and cause major, major issues. All right, so again, Right. I appreciate how important it is to be beautiful, but I also appreciate how yummy cheeseburgers are. So if you eat 17 cheeseburgers for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, right, your body's going to produce extra adipose to store that. But here's an interesting fact about adipocytes. Adipocytes do not divide. If I start eating 17 cheeseburgers for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, what happens to the adipocytes that I have? They just grow. Yeah, they get bigger. They expand to hold more fat. Of course, once we learned that, that was awesome piece of information because now if I really enjoy eating cheeseburgers for, for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I can just go to my friendly neighborhood plastic surgeon who has a vacuum cleaner with a special attachment that he can stick underneath my skin and suck out all my adipocytes. At which point I will then look beautiful. I can continue to eat 17 cheeseburgers for breakfast, lunch, and dinner and not have to worry because the doctor removed all my adipocytes. So there's not gonna be any left. They can't divide anymore. So no matter how many cheeseburgers I eat, I will still say thin and beautiful, right? No. Why not? Because your body's going to 
create some, but they just won't divide. How? How can it create some if I've gotten rid of all of the adipocytes? Now, again, we're assuming the doctor with his vacuum was actually able to vacuum them all out, which he probably wouldn't be able to do. But let's say theoretically, they come up with a brand new ad uh, vacuum cleaner that can actually suck all of the adipocytes out of my spare tire here, right? Then why can't I continue to eat 17 cheeseburgers for breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Stem, the stem cell? Cool. Ah, there you go. Brian's got in the room. Absolutely. Wasn't there a pluripotent stem cell that can make all of the cells associated with connective tissues? What was mm -hmm. that called again? Hey. Pluripotent. It is a pluripotent. What was the name of that pluripotent? Omnipotent. No. Omnipotent? No. No, it, we, it is a pluripotent stem cell, but that pluripotent stem cell, the one specifically that makes connective tissues, had a name. What was the name of that pluripotent? Mesenchymal. Mesenchymal, absolutely. While I may have removed all my adipocytes, I still have mesenchymal stem cells. And so if I continue to eat 17 cheeseburgers for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, the mesenchymal stem cells will make more adipocytes and my spare tire will come back. So there you go, exactly. So while the cells themselves don't divide, as you guys pointed out, we do still have uh, stem cells, pluripotent stem cells that can produce new ones. So liposuction isn't the route to go either. All right, excellent. Questions on that? All right, that leaves us with our last loose connective tissue, and that is reticular connective tissue. Not surprisingly, reticular connective tissue is made up of reticular fibers. Remember those reticular fibers are also made of collagen, but notice when we look at the light microscopy, when we look at the illustration of it, Rather than long fibers that are smooth, they're short and elaborately branched. They're these short, elaborately branched fibers. If any of you have ever been back east before, uh, you might have seen a cherry blossom tree. These always remind me of the cherry blossom trees. Cherry blossom trees have short, very elaborately branched uh, branches to them. And then these beautiful little pink uh, uh, um, flowers to them. So again, it is a very distinct tissue, very easy to identify. And again, the advantage of this reticular uh, connective tissue is there's a lot of space for things like a lot of white blood cells. So we find this in places like the liver, places like the spleen, places like the lymph node, and in our bone marrow. This is where we find our reticular connective tissue. All right. Questions on that? Nope. All right, excellent. That leaves us with one more tissue, blood. We'll talk about blood in much more detail when we get to the cardiovascular system in 431. It is a connective tissue but it is a very unique connective tissue. What makes blood so unique? Hemoglobin. True, well, that's, it is definitely something that is special about it, but what's even more special about blood? How is blood different from every other tissue we've talked about? Tubular. Right. Can I cut a piece of it out and put it on the slide the same way I can any other tissue we've talked about? It has no nucleus. Well, okay, some of the cells do. You guys are overthinking about this. It's a fluid. All those other things you said are true, but what's even more unique about it is the fact that blood is a fluid, right? I can't cut out a piece of blood and put it on a slide. I can pour a drop of blood onto the slide and look at it that way, but it's a fluid, absolutely. And being a fluid, it's hard to think of it in terms of a connective tissue. After all, as we know, a connective tissue has to have cells and it has to have a matrix. And that matrix needs to be made up of ground substance and fibers. Now, 
Let's start easy. Does blood have cells? Yes. Yes, although sort of. What are the things that are the cells in our blood? There's pictures of them right over here to the right, if you're not sure. Red blood cells. Red blood cells. What else? White blood cells. What else? Monocyte. Oh, sorry. That's it. Uh, neutrophil. Neutrophil is a type of white blood cell. Oh. Monocyte's a type of white blood cell. What's the other thing you find in the blood? Come on, I know you know. Platelets. Platelets. Excellent. Those are the three things that we think of in terms of cells. However, as someone mentioned earlier, when you look at this red blood cell, does it look like a typical cell that we've talked about and identified? No. No. And the biggest difference, as was mentioned, is it doesn't have a nucleus. In fact, it doesn't have pretty much any organelles. It's a big bag of hemoglobin. And a big bag of hemoglobin is not really a true cell. It was at one time a true cell, but now it has become specialized that it's not really a true cell anymore. Now, notice when we look at the neutrophil and the monocytes, white blood cells have nuclei. They can divide, they can metabolize, they can do all those things. Those are definitely true cells. But what about a platelet? Is there a platelet on any of these pictures? No. Turns out there is. I know it looks just like a speck of dirt on the slide, but that little piece of chewed up chewing gum sitting on the side of the sidewalk actually is a platelet. Platelets are actually cell pieces. They are the arms and legs that are ripped off of another larger cell. So they came from a cell at one point, but being cell pieces, they're not true cells. So notice when we talk about blood having cells, it has things that used to be parts of cells or used to be a true cell. Yeah, white blood cells are true cells. So it meets the criteria, but the definition gets a little tricky. So while they are cells or former cells, uh, we give them a more generic term. When we talk about blood, these cell or cell-like structures are what we call the formed elements. So we have formed elements, they meet the criteria of cells, so we have that. For the matrix, obviously the matrix of our blood is the plasma, and it is mostly water and stuff dissolved in it. So that definitely meets the criteria of the ground substance, right? Fibers are a little bit trickier, but remember we already learned about that, fibronectin, or another example, fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is a water-soluble fiber that when the right chemicals are present will come out of solution, become fibrin. And when it becomes fibrin, it helps to form that blood clot. So it does have fibers, it does have ground substance, it does have cells. So blood definitely is a connective tissue. Now, we just have one more minor issue. In an anatomy and physiology class, are we going to get away with terms like red blood cells and white blood cells and platelets? No. No. So let's use the appropriate terminology. What is the appropriate anatomical term for a red blood cell? Now, if only I had my connective tissue list in front of me, I might be able to figure it out. Erythrocyte. 
Yeah. Your erythrocytes. What is the appropriate anatomical term for our white blood cells? Leukocyte. And what is the appropriate anatomical term for a platelet? Thrombocyte. There you go. So on the exam, if I show you a slide like this and I have an arrow like this and I point it here and ask you to identify the formed element, don't say red blood cell, say erythrocyte, All right? Formed element, don't say white blood cell, say leukocyte. <clears throat> Don't say platelet, say thrombocyte. Now, there are, I will tell you, five distinct types of white blood cells, like the monocyte, like the neutrophils that we see here. I'm not going to hold you responsible for distinguishing the five different types. We'll get that in 431. So all you have to know is be able to tell a white blood cell, a red blood cell, and a platelet. And of course, use the right terms for them. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. So with that, we are done with our connective tissues. So we did that, we did that, we did that. The book's got a nice table for that. The last thing we need to do to finish our tissues is we need to put them together to form membranes. Now this is gonna have a massive amount of vocabulary with it. So I think it's better to do from scratch starting on uh, Thursday morning, although I would strongly encourage you to look at this material ahead of time. However, what I want to do quickly is to go back and go through our histology of our connective tissues and kind of, again, go through them the same way we did with the previous ones. Notice the point of this isn't to go through it long enough that you can do all the drawings and do all the labelings. I just want to introduce you to these things so that you know what you're supposed to be doing and what you're supposed to be drawing. So I want to go through these things together and we'll do the same thing briefly with the connective tissues because we have a little bit of time left here in class. So identify the tissue type. Areolar. Connective Areolar tissue. connective tissue, excellent. Did you know that because you recognized it because it was cobwebby or because like I told you before, if you don't know what else to guess, guess areolar. A little bit of both. Excellent. Little, and it's also the first thing on the list. That makes it easy that way as well. Excellent. Again, it definitely has that cobwebby appearance to it. And notice as we look at that, it basically has two types of fibers. These big, larger, coarse fibers, which are the collagen fibers. But notice if we increase the magnification, the collagen fibers become a little less distinct. We can still kind of see one going through here, but notice what becomes more obvious are these dark distinct elastic fibers. So this here we can see are made up of elastic fibers, collagen fibers, and all sorts of um, hunk and junk in all of the ground space dozens of different types of cells. And notice typically when we see the cells in a tissue like this, we're really just seeing the nucleus. So is there a way with looking at the nucleus that you can tell these cells apart? Well, it turns out technically yes. However, do I expect you to be able to do it? No. However, let's look here. Notice when we look at this tissue, I see a nucleus and I see a nucleus and I see a nucleus, but then I see these three cells here. Notice with these three cells, especially these two in particular, because they're a little bit better in focus, I can clearly see the nucleus, but notice I also see all of their cytoplasm as well. The reason for this is these cells are just chalk filled with a very, and I'm gonna go ahead and erase that so we can get a better view of it. These cells are just chalk filled with a very special substance, a very special protein. Any idea what this protein, what this chemical, what this substance might be?
Jacob, I think you tried to say it, but I didn't hear it. Is it chromatin? No, not a bad guess. It's actually the one you asked me about earlier. Do you remember what it was? Again, people, you should have your connective tissue list in front of you, which makes answering these questions a lot easier. You don't get to have that handout in front of you when you take the test. So what- chemical... Was it the histamine uh, granules? Yeah, exactly, histamine. These are the histamine granules. These cells that are chalk filled with histamine are what type of cells? Uh, Airy. Mast cells. These are what are known as mast cells. They're the only cells we need to be able to recognize on an areolar connective tissue. And the way they're easy to recognize is because they're chalk filled with these very dense granules, basically vesicles, that contain a chemical called histamine. And while you may not have ever heard of a real art connective tissue before, or you may not have ever heard of a mast cell before, many of you have heard of histamine before. Because typically when we think of histamine, what is it that histamine does? What does histamine do? Come on, I know you guys know. I know it's late in the day. I know we've been talking a while, but we have tomorrow off. So hang with me just a little bit longer. For your immune response? Yeah, inflammation, not just your immune response, but, it, but histamine is responsible for inflammation. It causes the blood vesicles to get dilated. It causes them to get leaky. The area becomes red, becomes warm, becomes swollen, becomes painful because of that appropriate immune response. The problem is that other things like your neighbor cutting their grass, releasing pollen into the air, can cause an inappropriate release of histamine, right? What do we typically call that? They were like allergies? Yeah, allergies, absolutely. And how do you combat those allergies if you have to mow the lawn? And histamine. You take an antihistamine. Antihistamine basically blocks the receptor that histamine would normally bind to so that it doesn't dilate the blood vessels. It doesn't bring more blood to the mucous membrane. You stop making more mucus as a result of that and you feel a little better, All right? So again, this histamine is a very important chemical and here in our real art connective tissues, it's found in the mast cells. It makes these mast cells very, very distinct, very obvious because we see not just the nucleus, but the entire cell because it's filled with those dark granules. So that's the one cell of the areolar art connective tissue you'll need to identify. What tissue is this? Adipose. What cell is this? Adipose. 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 What organelle is this? Can you guys see, see if I do that? Here, let's do this. Identify the organelle. Nucleus. Nucleus. Nucleus, there you go. Pretty simple and straightforward. Tissue is this. Reticular connective yeah. tissue. Identify the linear structure. Reticular fibers. Excellent. Identify the protein this linear structure is formed by. Collagen. Collagen, excellent. Identify one location where you would find this tissue. The liver. Liver, where else? Spleen. Spleen. Lymph nodes. And? Bone marrow. Perfect, excellent. Excellent. Identify this tissue down here. Elastic connective tissue? Not a bad guess. Notice there are indeed linear structures that we see here, but notice the linear structures are more disorganized in their orientation. They're not going the same direction. So dense, irregular? Exactly. 
Now notice this particular stain doesn't show the fibers quite as well. But what if we look at this one? Here we can very clearly yeah, very see the fibers at all the different orientations. Again, mostly collagen fibers at different orientations. Again, notice some we're seeing have been cut longitudinally. Some have been cut obliquely. Some have been cut on a cross section where we can see right through the center of it. So again, all these different orientations to the way they've been cut. And once one of the locations where you'd find this dense irregular connective tissue, the dermis of the skin. Yeah, the dermis of our skin. Excellent. Perfect. Right. We did these two already. So what tissue is this again? Dense regular connective tissue. And where would we find it? Uh, tendons and ligaments. And what was the difference between a tendon and a ligament again? What does a tendon do? Tendon Connect. is bone to muscle. And ligament is? Bone to bone. Perfect. All right. Notice again, also dense, regular. This one doesn't show the fibers as well, but this one does an awesome job of showing the nuclei. And again, there's the one that's sort of like it. Here's that elastic connective tissue. Again, small dot-like nuclei. They're not elongated. They're not large. More coarse fibers. And what was the thing that I said you wouldn't see all the time, but was a dead giveaway that you were looking at an elastic connective tissue? It is stained yellow. Yeah, if the fibers themselves stain yellow, then that is a dead giveaway you're looking at an elastic connective tissue. Ooh, identify the tissue. Island cartilage. Island cartilage. Notice you can clearly see the space. Identify the space. The lacuna. 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 But again, again, as long as you spell it correctly, that's all I care about. Identify the cell. Chondrocyte. Yeah. Identify the substance. Ground substance. True, although in this case, it's actually the ground substance and the fibers. Because remember, in our hyaline cartilage, the fibers are actually dissolved in it. So this would actually just be the matrix. But you have the right idea. The way we know this is hyaline cartilage is that the matrix is clear. Notice it can be stained, but we're not seeing the fibers in it. This is also hyaline cartilage. We see the lacuna. We see the chondrocyte, we see the uniform matrix. Very different, oh, I lied, but also hyaline cartilage. Anyone know what this is over here? You don't actually have to know this for the exam. I was just curious if anybody knew. Is it, I think it's muscle tissue, right? Yeah, not just any muscle tissue, but skeletal muscle tissue because right, we see the stripes on it, skeletal muscle tissue has stripes. The reason I have this picture here is remember, one of the things we know about cartilage is they are avascular. Because of that, for them to get the oxygen and the nutrients they need, hyaline cartilage, and in fact, many cartilages, will actually have another connective tissue that wraps all the way around it wraps around the entire, dare I say, perimeter of the hyaline cartilage. It houses the immature cells. It houses the blood vessels that are going to provide its support and provide it nutrients. Now, just out of curiosity, what type of tissue do you think this is around the hyaline cartilage? Looks like... Um... Dense regular? Dense irregular. I know it looks regular because it's a thin layer, but it's actually a dense irregular connective tissue. Now, is this the only place we find a dense irregular connective tissue in the body? No. 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 So this particular dense irregular connective tissue, we can give a name based on its location. 
the fact that it is a round cartilage. So what would the name we would give this dense irregular connective tissue based on its location? You like chondrial or regular? You had it. What is it? I was just guessing dense, like irregular chondry something. <laughs> You absolutely are very, very close. You absolutely have the right idea. It is around the cartilage, right? It goes around the perimeter of the cartilage. So it is a perichondrium, which I believe is one of the terms on your list that you're responsible for, right? So this, for the hyaline cartilage, you need to know that there is a perichondrium that wraps around it. That's its name based on its location. And the tissue type is a dense irregular connective tissue. Excellent, 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 excellent. All right, that is our hyaline cartilage. And again, we can tell it's hyaline cartilage because of the uniform matrix. Compare this tissue to this tissue. Notice we still very clearly have our lacunas, have our chondrocyte inside. But when we look at the matrix here, there are all these fibers at all these different orientations, right? Elastic cartilage. Exactly, this is our elastic cartilage. When I see this, I just wanna grab my bong, a Dave Matthews CD and just stare at it for hours, right? Again, it's got that funky appearance with this all elaborate, dark, distinct collagen fibers go, uh, pardon me, dark, distinct elastic fibers going at all sorts of different orientations. And where would we find this tissue? Your ears. Yep. Where was the other place? Larynx. Right, or, or the epiglottis, right? <laughs> Which is part of larynx, okay. except larynx on the exam for this part. Just out of curiosity, where do we find the hyaline cartilage again? Bridge of the nose. Yeah, and where was the other place? Joints between bones. Yeah, and the joints where we find where our bones come together at the end of the bones where they form joints. Excellent, excellent. Notice, lastly, again we have lacunas, we have chondrocytes, we have a matrix, but notice this one's not smooth but it's also not dark and distinct and chaotic. This one, we can see there's more subtle fibers and they're all a little bit more parallel, right? Even at a lower magnification view, we can see still some relative parallelness to these fibers. In fact, these collagen fibers become so parallel Notice that the lacunas and the chondrocytes start to line up in rows. There are so many collagen fibers that instead of our lacunas being just randomly spread around, there are so many collagen fibers, they tend to start to line up in rows. So guess what type of cartilage this is? Fibrocartilage. Fibrocartilage. And where did we say we would find this? Between the bones of the vertebrae. Excellent. So the intervertebral discs between the bones of the vertebrae. And where was the other place? Uh, the pelvic bridge. I can't yeah. remember what it's called. Pubic symphysis. Absolutely. Absolutely. Excellent. Excellent. What tissue is this? Bone, Bone. tissue. Uh, space. Central canal. Central canal. Central canal. Space. Lacuna. Lacuna. Now, cell. Osteocytes. Osteocyte. Technically, do you see the osteocyte? No. No, no. I don't see it either. But if you've got a lacuna in bone, you know there has to be an osteocyte in there. And that's exactly how I'd ask it on the exam. I would have this same pointer and I would ask either of those two questions. Identify the space 
and you would say lacuna, identify the cell, and you would say osteocyte. Yes, this stain, this magnification, we don't see the cell. But if we have a cave, we know we have a bear. If we have a lacuna, we know we have an osteocyte. And what is this entire organizing structure? Osteons. Osteon, excellent. Tissue? Blood. Formed element? Leukocyte? Yep, formed element. Erythrocyte? Formed element. And that one right there. So. Thrombocyte. There you go. There you go. Just that simple. All right. Again, I fully appreciate that we did not go through these fast enough for you to draw and write everything down. But that wasn't the point of this. We don't have time in the class for us to do all of that. But what I did want to do was at least quickly go through these handouts and make sure that you understood what you were responsible for. If you've at least been exposed to it once, then hopefully when you look at your textbook, when you look at your lab manual, when you look in your histology atlas, when you look at the other resources that are available for you, having this familiarity with it, having gone through it once, hopefully will help you uh, to be successful as you're doing this on your own to fill out that handout that you'll be turning in for a grade. But even more importantly than turning it in for a grade is going to be your major study guide for, like I said, probably uh, somewhere between 25% and a third of your lab exam. All right. Excellent. Questions on any of that? I know some of you reached out to me by email because you were struggling a little bit with this histology stuff. Hopefully the things we did today helped. If not, again, I have office hours right after class. I'm gonna go grab a quick bite and then I'll be back up here in about 10 minutes. So if you wanna to come to my office and ask more questions, or if you have questions with Physio X or questions on anything else, I am happy to answer and address those. So please, as always, feel free. And again, you don't need an appointment for that. Just click on the link that's on our homepage. That is my, uh, that is my, um, my office for my Zoom uh, meetings and uh, I can meet you in there, all right? Questions on any of that? Also, tomorrow, hope that lab, open lab. Yes. Oh, excellent. Yeah, yeah. Tomorrow is open lab. Jeff will be there. And I believe he also has histology slides and can help you guys with this stuff as well. So absolutely. Yep. He's a great resource as well. All right. Excellent. Any other questions? All right. That is it for today. Study hard on your day off. And I will see you guys on Thursday. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.